two hours? We will call the meeting to order and uh, full committee hearing this morning on the national security challenges and U.S. military activity in North and South America, uh, part of our on ongoing series uh, for this year to get ready for the FY21 budget cycle, basing this off of the bu budget that the president submitted for FY21. And our witnesses this morning are the Honorable Kenneth Rapuano, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security, Admiral Craig C. Fowler, who is the commander of the U.S. Southern Command, and General Terrence O'Shaughnessy, who is the commander of U.S. Northern Command. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning. Um, we've discussed a number of the issues surrounding the overall defense budget. I think that's the thing we're most interested in, is how your piece fits into that. Uh, we've got the blank slate review, which is an attempt to sort of look at everything within DOD and build out a strategy based on what's to come, based primarily on the premise that we're still kind of stuck in the past a little bit um, in terms of where we're spending our money, where our priorities are, and we need to shift those priorities. Now, as always, when you're shifting priorities, it's very easy to focus on what the new priority should be. Uh, the harder part is figuring out what you're going to do less of to, to balance that out. Um, and we want to see how that strategy builds together. I understand that the blank slate review for your two commands, I think, is not not yet done at any rate. So we're curious what you see in that, what you would say, here's what we need to do more, here's what we need to do less. How, how can we balance that out? Um, obviously on the NORTHCOM side, Homeland Security is the number one priority. So we're also particularly curious how you work with the Department of Homeland Security, what your responsibilities are, what their responsibilities are, how, how those things balance out. And there's considerable concern on the committee about the reprogramming request um, that, that most impacts these two commands that took $3.8 billion out of existing procurement uh, to put it into uh, further building the wall in the southern border. Um, we're very concerned about how those priorities were set and the impact that it might have um, on, on the programs that were cut going forward. And it's worth noting also that there's still to come $3.6 billion, which is supposed to be taken out of MILCON. And that's in addition to the $3.6 billion that was taken last year. Uh, the impact that that is going to have um, is, is profound. Um, so we're concerned about that. We'd also be interested in various troop deployments to the southern border. And we know that typically these are requests from DHS that are supposed to be reimbursed. Um, they have not been being reimbursed. Where do you see those requests going? And um, do you see you getting paid back for that? How, how do we balance the money on all, all of those issues? And also when it comes to, to Homeland Security, we are concerned about election interference, not, not just from Russia, but from a variety of different countries. As we head towards 2020, that's gonna be a major concern. What are you doing to prepare for that? And then, most importantly, overarching all of this, is the coronavirus outbreak um, that is going to have a huge impact on every community. If you, you watched the press conference yesterday, I think the smartest thing said is if it hasn't impacted you yet, it will. Uh, being from the state of Washington, we, it started there first, but it is by no means done. Uh, we've seen it you know, spread quickly to New York yesterday, a major problem in Massachusetts. Um, if you understand the epidemiology of this at all, um, it is going to put an enormous amount of pressure on our country. Now, primarily, um, that is not the responsibility of, of DOD, but certainly um, from a NORTHCOM perspective, we want to know what you could potentially do to contribute to, to meeting that threat. Um, and from a SOUTHCOM perspective, eventually, in all likelihood, it will be a factor um, in Latin America as well and how it impacts that. So there are many challenges. I have uh, them more laid out in a more detailed way in my opening statement, which I'll submit for the record. With that, I'll turn it over to the ranking member, Mr. Thornberry, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me join in welcoming all of our witnesses uh, here today. Uh, like the other combatant commands, these two have a lot on their plate, and uh, it is absolutely part of our responsibility to understand their budgetary needs and capabilities to meet their responsibilities. I am struck by the fact, though, that with these two commands, as with others, uh, extraneous events also get a vote. 
And, and so in Southcom, you got to watch and deal with what happens in Venezuela. With Northcom, uh, as you mentioned, what's the military support for coronavirus, not only now, but how may that develop in the, in the future? Um, that's, that's part of, I think, the, the specific challenging part of putting together a military budget. It's the other side, whatever the other side is, gets a vote. And uh, I appreciate uh, the challenges that both of these commanders have with a whole variety of issues, and uh, we'll look forward to their answers to our questions. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rapuano. Mm. Or I'm assuming you're going first. Go ahead. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the national security challenges faced by the United States and the Department of Defense actions to meet these challenges. I'm honored to be here in the company of General O'Shaughnessy, the commander of NORAD and U.S. Northern Command, and Admiral Fowler, the commander of U.S. Southern Command. I am the principal civilian policy advisor to the Secretary of Defense and the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy on a diverse range of issues, including homeland defense, cyber, space, countering weapons of mass destruction, mission assurance, and defense support to civil authorities. I'd like to emphasize three key points today. The first is the U.S. homeland is not a sanctuary. Rather, the homeland is a target in a complex global security environment. Two, China and Russia are using malign influence against the United States and our neighbors to undermine regional security. And lastly, we have taken action to ensure our nation and partners will prevail in this security environment. China and Russia are seeking capabilities to win below the threshold of armed conflict to erode our national security and prosperity. They are attempting to undermine democratic governance, the rule of law, market-driven economies, and compliance with international rules and norms. Our competitors' capabilities, strategies, and actions underscore that we must anticipate multidimensional attacks on land, in the air, at sea, in space, and in cyberspace, targeted not just against our military forces, but against our critical infrastructure and our population, indeed our way of life at home and abroad. Should conflict arise, China and Russia hope to prevent the U.S. from intervening in the defense of our allies and partners. China's arsenal includes anti-satellite capabilities and advanced missile systems. China has also successfully tested hypersonic glide vehicles and claimed or created and militarized islands in the South China Sea in its efforts to coerce the U.S. and our allies and partners. Although Russia poses a different challenge, it too is developing anti-satellite capabilities, advanced missile, hypersonic glide vehicles, and advanced cyber capabilities. Rogue regimes such as North Korea, Iran, and Venezuela continue to pose threats to the United States and our allies and partners. Iran is investing significant resources on ballistic missile and space launch capabilities, which could lead to the development of ICBM systems. With support from Russia, Cuba, and China, the Maduro regime fails to provide Venezuelans with sufficient food and medicine. In response, most governments in the region have recognized interim president Juan Guaido as a legitimate leader of Venezuela. Despite our successes, Terrorists, transnational criminal organizations, cyber hackers, and other malicious non-state actors threaten us with increasingly sophisticated capabilities. We are countering threats to our nation and our regional partners. Our actions will deny adversary benefits from aggression, impose costs on adversaries should they commit acts of aggression against the United States and our strategic interests. These efforts and our sustained regional engagement undermine our competitors' attempts to increase their influence near U.S. borders. The U.S. is strengthening its homeland missile defenses. DOD is developing a new interceptor to meet future threats. We are developing a new generation of advanced ground and space-based sensors to better detect, track, and discriminate enemy missile warheads. These capabilities will enhance our ability to deny our adversaries benefits from missile attack. Space systems underpin virtually every U.S. weapon system. China and Russia both seek to deny the U.S. and our allies and partners the advantages of space. The U.S. is responding to this threat by transforming our space enterprise and working closely with our allies and partners. 
The President's budget requests provides $18 billion for space programs, including $111 million to support the establishment of the new military service. The budget also funds the new Space Combatant Command, U.S. Space Command, and the Space Development Agency, which will accelerate and develop and feeling of military space systems. New presidential policy on cyberspace operations, as well as statutory authority, have enabled a proactive approach to competition in cyberspace. For example, Cyber Command engages in hunt forward operations, defensive cyber teams operating globally at the invitation of our allies and partners. Working closely with our partners and informed by the whole of nation approach, similar to those framed by the Cyberspace Solarium Commission report issued today, we are maturing our concept of labored, layered cyber deterrence. The department is focused on preventing WMD proliferation globally and ensuring U.S. military forces are prepared to respond to WMD incidents and operate in contaminated environments. We are working with our federal partners and with other public and private sector partners to expand sharing of threat information that affects defense critical infrastructure and the defense industrial base. DOD is better prepared to assist civil authorities than at any other time in our nation's history. In 2019, DOD responded to 113 requests for assistance. So far in 2020, DOD has responded to 20 requests for assistance. While the department's number one priority is defense of the homeland, we are also enhancing the security of our allies and partners in the Western Hemisphere through several primary lines of effort. Working with partners to limit, to limit malign influence, the authoritarian, the authoritarian model, excuse me, offered by China and Russia uses economic, diplomatic, and security means to gain undue influence over the sovereign decisions of others. We are working with our allies and partners to counter this threat. Collaboration with our partners. We are advancing defense relationships with our self-funding partners while continuing support for our traditional training and equip programs focusing on strategic level cooperation. Sustaining defense cooperation through institution building, our defense institution building is an increasingly important aspect of our efforts. We seek to share experiences and help them implement processes that magnify the effectiveness and sustainability of all other aspects of our cooperation. The Department of Defense takes a global view of the challenges facing the nation. We continue to improve our ability to defend the U.S. homeland in all domains and develop capabilities to defend the nation's interests globally. I appreciate the critical role Congress plays in ensuring the Department is prepared to compete, deter, and win in every contested domain, air, land, space, and cyberspace. I especially thank the men and women of the Department of Defense and their families for all that they do every day to keep our nation safe and secure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, General Shaughnessy. Chairman Smith, Ranking Men Member Thornberry, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm truly honored to be here today as a commander of U.S. Northern Command and North American Aerospace Defense Command. I'm also pleased to testify alongside my cousin, Admiral Craig Fowler, and Mr. Rapuano, both of whom I have great admiration for. And Chairman Smith, with your concurrence, I'd like to submit my written statement for the record. U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are charged with executing the National Defense Strategy's number one objective, defend the homeland. Our adversaries have watched, learned, and invested to offset our strengths while exploiting our weaknesses. They have demonstrated patterns of behavior that, in, that indicate their capability, capacity, and intent to hold our homeland at risk below the nuclear threshold. The changing security environment makes it clear that the Arctic is no longer a fortress wall and the oceans are no longer protective moats. They are now avenues of approach to the homeland, which highlights the increase in adversary presence in the Arctic. To meet this challenge, we need to invest in a capable, persistent defense that can deter adversaries, protect critical infrastructure, enable power projection forward, and prevent homeland vulnerabilities from being exploited. To deter, detect, and defeat the threats arrayed against the homeland today, U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are transforming our commands in our way of thinking. We cannot defend the nation against 21st century threats with 20th century technology. We must be able to outpace our adversaries using a layer defense infused with the latest technology. To do so, and to secure our comparative, competitive advantage, 
we will continue to partner with our nation's defense and commercial industry to transform rapidly evolving scientific information into leading edge digital age technology. And the Strategic Homeland Integrated Ecosystem for Layered Defense, or what we call SHIELD, is the architecture we need to defend our homeland against these advancing threats. As such, our layered defense needs to establish awareness in all domains, from below the oceans to the highest levels of space, including the unseen cyber domain, which are all at risk. We need a layered sensing grid with sensors in all domains which can detect and track threats from their point of origin long before approaching our sovereign territory. In other words, it requires the ability to identify and eliminate the archers before the arrows are released. We need an adaptive architecture for joint all domain command and control capable of fusing a myriad of sensors across the globe into accurate decision quality threat information and at the speed of relevance for effective command and control. The Department of Defense with the United States Air Force in the lead is using the 2021 budget to further this capability of joint all domain command and control. And lastly, we need the ability to deploy defeat mechanisms capable of neutralizing advanced weapon systems in order to defend our great homeland. We have put great effort into these areas, such as ballistic missile defense, and the need also exists to aggressively defeat additional threats to include the ever-growing cyber threat and the cruise missile threat. And consistent with these concepts, we are changing how we are engaging with industry. We have shared our toughest challenges with our industry partners and have received an overwhelming response from not only traditional defense contractors, but also small and large commercial companies to leverage the military application of advancements we've seen in the commercial industry. We are harnessing emerging, existing, and rapidly evolving technology to plug into our shield, our architecture for home and defense. However, more needs to be done to keep pace with the advancing threats to our homeland. We need to ensure we have a complete awareness of what is happening in and around our sovereign territory. We are mindful of the gravity of our mission and the trust you have placed in us. Aligned with the national defense strategy and capturing our sense of urgency, we at US NORTHCOM and NORAD have declared 2020 as a year of homeland defense and are moving forward with the implementation of our shield. You and the committee should have great faith in the men and women at US NORTHCOM and NORAD because together we have the watch. Thank you for your support and I look forward to your questions. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored to be here with Secretary Ravalano and my friend, shipmate and cousin, General O'Shaughnessy. We work very closely together to defend the homeland and ensure there's no seams between our regions because we certainly know the bad guys don't pay attention to seams. Last year, General O'Shaughnessy and I traveled to Mexico City and Guatemala City to make that very point to our friends and neighbors. I'm joined by Ambassador Gene Maines, former U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador and my civilian deputy, who brings with her a wealth of knowledge about our region and a deep understanding of China in our hemisphere. Western Hemisphere is our shared home. It's our neighborhood. We're connected to the nations here in every domain, sea, air, land, space, cyber, and most importantly, with our values. Over the last year, I've seen firsthand the opportunities and the challenges that impact the security of our hemisphere. And we've also understand the urgency with which we must react to those challenges. I've come to describe the challenge as a vicious circle of threats that deliberately erodes the stability and security in the region and our homeland. Vicious circles framed by systemic issues that face young democracies like weak institutions, corruption that are exploited by transnational criminal organizations and $90 billion a year industry in this hemisphere. These, these institutions are often better funded than the security organizations they face. And external state actors that don't share our values, China, Russia, and Iran, and violent extremist organizations exploit this. They're trying to advance their own ends at the expense of US and partner nation security. In fact, the aha moment for me this past year has the bet in the extent to which China is aggressively pursuing their interests right here in our neighborhood. Why would China invest in critical infrastructure like deep water ports and large swaths of co coastline within a two hour flight from Miami? Why would China want to lock up total interest in a space station in this hemisphere? They certainly recognize the importance of this part of the world and so must we. This vicious circle I described can be seen most acutely in the tragedy that is Venezuela. 
human suffering in this once thriving democracy has driven f nearly 5 million people to flee to neighboring countries like Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and, and more. These countries are absorbing the migrants and the strain that is placed on their health care, education, and security services. Colombia alone has spent over $2.5 billion in the last two years to support migrants. And while Russia, Cuba, and China prop up the illegitimate Maduro dictatorship, the democracies of the world are looking for a way to get the Venezuelan people what they deserve, a free and prosperous Venezuela. The best way to attack this vicious circle is a team, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM team, our interagency team, our whole of nation team, and with our partners. In this neighborhood, a little goes a long way, and our partners are willing to contribute, especially with U.S. encouragement, investment, and presence. In recognition of the complex threats challenging our neighborhood, there will be an increase in U.S. military presence in the hemisphere later this year. This will include an enhanced presence of ships, aircraft, and security forces to reassure our partners, improve U.S. and partner readiness, and interoperability and counter a range of threats to include illicit narco-terrorism. Last year, our partners played a critical role in 50 percent of our drug interdictions, up from 40 percent the year before. Getting our partners in the game by training and equipping them through security cooperation programs is exactly the right approach. These threats affect all of us here in our neighborhood, and we must tackle them together. Likewise, international military education training, IMET, is a small investment that yields long-term returns. It builds lasting, trusted relationships. As I speak, half our region's chiefs of defense are graduates of IMET. Along with exercises, exercises are a North Star. IMET exercises and security cooperation are the last programs we should consider cutting. Deployments like the United States Naval Ship Comfort show the best outstretched hand of America. A mission this year treated nearly 68,000 patients, extending our enduring promise as a trusted partner to the neighborhood. Thanks to the support of this committee, we also deployed a multi-mission support vessel, acronym MMSV, a contracted innovative ship that is supporting counter-drug detection and supporting our partners as a platform for their, their extended reach. The MSV is using intelligence produced by Joint Interagency Task Force South, Jayada South. Jayada South, located in Key West, our southernmost base in the continental United States, is a strategic and significant value for defending a wide range of threats to our national security. And we are working to take steps to improve the resiliency and the quality of life there in one of the highest cost regions in the nation. At our headquarters in Miami, we are also working to address the cost of living and housing concerns that create hardships for our families. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Thornberry, thank you for the opportunity today. The Southcom team appreciates the support of Congress and the trust you place in us. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. I just have uh, two questions. Admiral Fowler, can you give us an update on Venezuela? You know, what, how are China and Russia potentially involved there? What are our interests there, and how is it impacting the region? The Maduro regime continues to cling to power and, and brutalize the population. Uh, the Human Rights Report this year uh, listed a significant number of uh, human rights abuses by the Maduro regime. Uh, Maduro stays in power because of the thousands of Cubans that protect and guard him and, and basically own the intelligence service in Venezuela. Russia and the numbers of hundreds right in there alongside, uh, working to upgrade air defense systems, uh, Russian special forces working to, to train and uh, Maduro forces, and China to a lesser extent, but China is involved in, in particularly in, uh, in some of the cyber areas, uh, working uh, to their uh, interest. Unfortunately, this has allowed Maduro to cling to power and continue to brutalize the population. The narco traffickers have taken advantage of this, as well as ELN and FARC dissidents terrorists, and that instability, along with the migrants, has, uh, has spawned instability out in the region. It's a cred to partners like the Colombia that, that they've handled it so well. And, and that's not going to change anytime soon. Maduro is pretty solidly in power at this point, would be your estimation. Maduro's isolated and continues to be isolated. International unity is, is, uh, is there. We're continuing to work with uh, Special Representative Elliot Abrams and State Department for the pressure campaign. Unfortunately, he, this transition can't happen enough, soon enough for the brutalized population. Thank you. General Shaughnessy, could you tell us what your missile defense needs are here for, for your, your command, where it's at, what your needs are uh, in the short term? Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to highlight some of the work that we're doing and some of the, the uh, 
the work that we need support in doing. First, on the ballistic missile front, uh, we have had uh, some, some success now on next generation interceptor. Uh, obviously, we, we would rather not be where we are relative to the uh, RKV, redesigned kill vehicle, but now that we are, we made a decision to stop that program, start NGI. I'm happy to report just yesterday we had the Joint Requirements Oversight Council that successfully met to talk about how do we actually bring this capability to bear sooner. One of the things we have to make sure is that we understand is the threat continues to advance. And so whilst we may have delays in our program, the threat doesn't stop. And so as a result of the great work we've done with MDA to include uh, the work with R&E, and the ability to actually figure out what is the capability that we most need and how can we bring it to bear at the speed of relevance. And I think we've had some success there. Part of that is because we're working with industry to understand what are the long poles in the tent, that what are the most challenging things that are driving a long time acquisition program, and what are the things we can do for the trade space where time is now a factor of risk so that we can bring that into the discussion. I'm happy to report we've made progress on that front and we're going to be able to bring this capability to bear sooner. And I look forward to the RFP ultimately being released and ultimately getting this capability. In the meantime, Chairman, it's also important we continue to pursue other means to include an underlayer, critically important as we have our GBIs, which are very capable uh, uh, system right now. We bring in an underlayer such as bringing in SM3 2As, which we're going to do a test in May to ensure that it can defeat an ICBM threat. That brings tremendous capability and opportunity and potential to what we can bring to the homeland. Uh, also looking at THAAD and how can we use THAAD for the protection of the homeland in ways that we haven't uh, yet done. The combination of all those together with the work we're doing on our sensors, our radars, to bring the discrimination capability forward is going to allow us to maintain that advantage over our adversaries so I can come to this committee and continue to tell you that we can defend against the ballistic missile threats uh, from a rogue nation. Thank you. Mr. Thornberry. Admiral, uh, yesterday we had CENTCOM and AFRICOM uh, before us, and one of the points I think everybody agreed on is great power competition occurs all over the world, including Africa, Middle East. You pointed out uh, China's very active in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but you also made the point that uh, cutting IMET and those sorts of training, uh, exercises, providing military equipment doesn't seem to make much sense. That's my interpretation. Can you give us just a scale of how much money you spend in, in your AOR on things like exercises and, and tra joint training and, and, and that sort of thing, and then what happens from last year to this year? The, uh, the programs you mentioned, I met the education program Exercise program, security cooperation are, are our pivotal programs. They're key. Uh, they are high return investment options. Uh, as we look at the, those programs, the IMED accounts have been solid with good support to increase IMED. And so we've asked for uh, an increase. We may see a modest increase. Uh, 11 million is what we spent last year. That's making a difference. Uh, the exercise program and the security cooperation, they, they received cuts in the defense wide review across the department. The, uh, the, the joint ex exercise program received a 10% reduction, and the, uh, the uh, security cooperation, our main Department of Defense funded program, which is called 333, uh, received a, a, a approximately a 20% reduction that's being distributed amongst the combatant commands. For me, the impact over the, of the, this coming year will be at around 20% reduction in our, our 333 money. It's, uh, and that reduction will mean we'll have to make some, some, some choices and have to defund some programs. And, uh, and those programs that we will defund are, are likely ones that have made an impact that have increased our partners' ability to do things like counter narcotics. You mentioned I'm at is 11 million. Give, what's a ballpark for putting all those programs together in your AOR ballpark? A ballpark for the, uh, our needs in those three programs, probably around 130 million per year if you, if you, if you total it. Uh, Okay, yeah, I think it's helpful for us just to have a perspective um, on that. Uh, General, uh, some uh, coronavirus folks are being housed at military bases. Uh, my understanding is some folks coming off this latest cruise ship, about 500 may go to Texas, 500 to Georgia or something like that. 
ex explain to us how you or the department balances effect on military readiness and, and the health and safety of our military folks versus the need to have some isolation for people who are coming off cruise ships or maybe in other circumstances. How, how, how do you know when it, it, it's, it, it hurts our military more uh, than it should? Or I, I don't, how do you balance that? That's what I'm trying to get to. Sir, thank you for allowing me to highlight this. And, and let me uh, first, um, acknowledge that we are, in fact, uh, housing uh, the, some U.S. citizens uh, as a result of the passenger ship uh, challenge that we're faced with. And, and to me, this needs to be a whole of nation response. And so the Department of Defense is contributing to that whole of nation response to take care of our citizens. Uh, specifically, uh, the guidance we, we were given from the Secretary of Defense was the first priority is to ensure the safety of our military personnel and their families. The second priority we were given was to ensure that we maintain our readiness, our ability to perform our core mission set, because of course that can't be degraded. And then with, it, with that in mind, we look at what can we add to the whole nation response. In the particulars that you mentioned here, we do have folks right now at Travis, at Miramar, at Lackland, and at Dobbins. Um, that is actually billeting rooms that we've provided. Uh, HHS uh, has been providing the actual what we call wraparound services to that. In other words, we are not providing the military, the, the medical capability. We're not providing some of those contract services. They're actually being provided by HHS. What that allows us to do is we can provide them the rooms. We can maintain our ability to take care of our own families and our own military members and do the mission that we need to do. And I think it's a good balance of where we are right now. We can contribute but no degradation to our ability to perform our mission, sir. Mr. Larson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rap uh, Rapuano and General O'Shaughnessy, I gave you a heads up on this question, but I wanted to get for the record, we had a call last night with our governor in the state regarding uh, the uh, COVID-19 response in our state and the uh, continued need for, for help and uh, but the question uh, he had and wanted to pass on and give some direction on this would be the ability or necessity of the uh, of Northcom DOD to support response uh, if we need a surge capacity for mobile uh, hospital units. We're not making that request now, um, but in, in the event that we um, need to make that request, where does Northcom or DOD fit into that uh, fit into that role? So. The Department of Defense is working the whole of government process managed by the, the President's White House uh, task force that is led by the Vice President, working very closely with CDC, HHS, DHS, and the other agencies involved. CDC, HHS, they are the lead uh, for the domestic response. They are also the lead for the medical response. Uh, there's very significant capacity that is available uh, to them, working with the state and locals as well. Uh, DHS and FEMA also have some levels of capability. Uh, the Department of Defense for the force that we have has relatively limited medical capacity, particularly with regard to the importance of uh, force health protection for the force and their dependents uh, and our other beneficiaries, but also the potential of contingency operations requiring additional medical capabilities on top of that. Uh, so, so we're very cognizant of that balance. When you look at the uh, low density, high value elements such as ICU beds and ventilators, the Department of Defense does not have a, a large number of those. That, that's not typically military medicine type of capabilities. So there's not a, a surplus of capability there. So again, we're working very closely with CDC and HHS in terms of where we can best support and how we can limit the impact on uh, defense readiness and capabilities. All right, that's fair enough. We'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll probably follow up uh, with you later on. Again, we're trying to um, do our best to prepare, and, and we are in contact with uh, CDC and HHS as well. Um, but our emergency operations center is active at Camp Murray in our state as well, so our, our, our local National Guard folks are helping out. Um, Secretary Rapuano, I have a question as the I'm also chair of the aviation subcommittee. Um, it's been a priority uh, for me that the department, um, any department or agency um, with counter UAS authority works hand in glove with the FAA in implementing its authority before deployment of counter UAS technology 
at any location. So can you, uh, since we gave the DOD some authorities uh, last couple of years on U counter UAS, what specific factors do you take into account before deploying uh, counter UAS equipment at any given location, given the uh, use of civilian airspace in order to uh, implement and operate counter UAS? Uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll give an overview and then hand over to General O'Shaughnessy. You got a minute and 41 seconds. Okay. We work very closely with FAA. We do have authorities for counter UAS domestically. Uh, those authorities are limited in terms of we, are, we have to take into account uh, undue risk to civil aviation, other, other activities uh, that, that are not threatening to DOD facilities. Uh, so, so that is a process that is ongoing. Uh, and, and again, I'll just in limited Great. time turn to General O'Shaughnessy to provide some additional stuff. Thanks. So we have a very robust relationship with the FAA. Uh, Steve Dixon and I have met multiple occasions to talk about these very, uh, very issues, and my, our staffs work on almost daily basis with this, and, as well as with the Department of Homeland Security, who, who plays an equally critical role uh, within this. And I would highlight, though, we do have different perspectives. Uh, in some ways, the FAA is concerned about that, that compliant operator, right, and the safety of flight of that compliant operator. Well, we're more worried about the non-compliant operators and how do we separate the non-compliant and potentially threat uh, from those that are doing things in accordance with the FAA rules. And so we, as we continue to work our way forward, this is a threat that we really have to find the right balance between safety for those to be able to operate and commercial businesses and whatnot that want to expand the use of USs, whilst it's still, still at the same time maintaining our ability to defend our critical installations as well as the, the, the national critical infrastructure. I think that partnership is right. I think the authorities are right. I think we, from, a, from an investment standpoint, need to also look at those things that will allow both. And some of the systems we employ overseas aren't quite as useful here at home when we have to have the continual operation of uh, airfields, uh, commercial, to include the commercial ones, whilst uh, being able to defend. So we need to invest uh, continued uh, within the commercial industry. Great. I'll have some follow-up questions later, but uh, thank you, and we'll yield back. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary and Admiral, you both in your opening statements and in your written statements <laughs> reference uh, China and Russia and um, their activities in, in South America. Mr. Secretary, you even talked of maligned influence. Um, what tools do you, do you see that you have in the DOD portfolio or what other things do we need to be doing to increase our, our influence in the area? Do we still have a competitive advantage? Are there th areas where we're not competing that we should? What, what are you seeing and advice would you give us? Thank you for that important question. We still have the competitive advantage, but that advantage is eroding. Uh, our competitive advantage remains in our education system. Our partners want to educate with us. China's seen that. A uh, recent example, they offer five to one. So if we're offering one slot to Carlisle, they're, they've come in behind us to offer five to their version of Carlisle. Um, some of our partners are taking them up on it. It seems to be a nice vacation, uh, but we are quality, so we'll take our quality any day. Our partners want to exercise with us. Uh, our partners want to do exchanges with us, and our partners want uh, to be able to afford uh, our gear, our equipment. It's the best built in America. Uh, unfortunately, some of our partners uh, have financial issues. China's figured that out. They've come in and started gifting large sums of uh, gear, trucks, boats uh, to partners. Uh, recent conversation with uh, a chief of defense in small Caribbean nation. Uh, he gets around to it and he says, yep, they only gave me 20 million last year. And our, I looked at my cheat sheet, and it was about one million across all our uh, assistance in the mill to mill. Uh, we don't need to outspend China. We just need to have enough and be present uh, to continue that leverage and that access, presence, and influence that we can bring as, as reliable, trusted partners. So I would just amplify uh, Admiral Fowler's points. Uh, we, we have unique differentiators as the United States and, and our alliance system. Uh, we, unlike the Chinese or the Russians, uh, have a very robust system of uh, alliance, uh, allies and partners. We don't have to spend them uh, dollar per dollar, but we do need to be resourcing these relationships and developing them uh, in a manner that makes clear where the benefits are and, and over the long term, uh, what is in the best interest of these nations. Uh, and it's very difficult sometimes when you look at the immediate 
lay down of what resources the Chinese are offering with maybe long-term payout in some areas. But it's increasingly, uh, if, if you just review the inputs that are coming out from around the world, it's, it's increasingly understood by nations that this is a predatory policy, particularly the Chinese approach, in terms of uh, the loss leader up front and then the dependence on systems for which they do not have the same control. So, so I, again, this is just how we can most thoughtfully apply not the same amount of resources, but increased resources to address this important challenge. General, you and I had the opportunity to talk yesterday of the uh, huge investment that we're going to be undertaking. Um, as we look to the National Defense Authorization this year, we have areas of space that we have to invest in, sensors, missile defense, even our nuclear deterrent is, is one that's going to require significant investment. You and I talked about your successors. Um, if we don't make these in investments, uh, tell us what your concerns would be uh, for your successors 10 years from now if, if we falter and don't modernize and invest in our systems. Uh, thank you for that opportunity to, to highlight these uh, very important uh, issues relative to our ability to defend our homeland. Uh, I'll start with our, our ballistic missile defense. We have a good program in place. We have a good plan in place. I think we, if we are able to execute that program as we have, as, as we have it designed with the underlayer, I think we'll be continue to uh, maintain that competitive advantage, both capacity and capability, uh, to defend our nation against the rogue nation, whether that be uh, a future development of capability in Iran or the current uh, North Korean uh, threat that we face. I think we often, though, have to think about the, the peer competitors that we have. Uh, Russia and China. And as we look at their actions and their activities and what they're investing in, we want to make sure we are able to stay ahead of them relative to our ability to defend our homeland. And it's not so much that we expect, for example, the Russians to be, uh, you know, uh, wake up in the morning and find that they're evading the United States of America. That's not what we're saying. But there could be a regional crisis, for example, in Europe, um, that then based on the nature of the, of the capability they have, which would very quickly expand to a global fight. Um, and so as we see that, we could very well uh, find ourselves where they are trying to hold us at risk, whether it be with cruise missiles, whether it be with cyber, uh, whether it be the myriad of uh, uh, capability that they have and they've been investing in. And so I think we have to look at I'm this sorry, with clear eyes. I should have said this up front. When we get to the end, I try, try to stop it. So if you could just yes, wrap sir. up quickly, John, this time. Uh, yes, sir. We, 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 just, we need to invest to maintain that competitive advantage uh, in order to, to maintain our ability to defend ourselves against all threats in all domains. Thank you. Mr. Landry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Rapuano, uh, General O'Shaughnessy, and uh, Admiral Fowler, thank you all for being here and your service to the country. Uh, obviously, you all face unique challenges across uh, the diplomatic, uh, information, military, and, uh, and uh, obviously economic uh, domains. And uh, the Arctic, uh, among one of them, uh, has rapidly become a battleground uh, in, in the great power competition that uh, we talked about here today. Uh, climate change is obviously already uh, exacerbating these challenges as we see increasing hostilities in more uh, navigable uh, waterways. Uh, my question is, uh, General O'Shaughnessy, um, do you agree that climate change is uh, an aggregating factor uh, in your theater? Uh, sure, what we are seeing is uh, diminished ice, uh, increased uh, usability of some of the waterways. We see increased activity. Uh, we see some of the impacts uh, of the result of that, for example, some erosion, uh, and those are all things that we have to take into account. From my particular uh, point of view, what I'm most concerned with is, as we do see uh, our potential adversaries increasing their capability and capacity to take advantage of some of these more navigable waters, uh, we also need to be able to operate in that environment. And so uh, I have a renewed uh, invigoration to make sure that we are able to operate in that Arctic environment. So my, my question is, how is uh, NorthCom factoring uh, the implications for changing climate dynamics in, in, its, in its military planning? So specifically what we're doing is maintaining our ability to, to operate, uh, looking at all facets of it, whether it's our infrastructure and make sure that we don't have impacts to our infrastructure as a result of uh, any changes that we see. But also, be, again, because we see more activity there because of the uh, environmental uh, impacts that we're seeing, we also have to make sure we have the ability to operate there, that we have in, invest in things like communication, domain awareness, uh, and infrastructure that will withstand those changes. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Fowler, anything that, that you have to add, Mr. Reparano? The um, ability to rapidly respond to uh, events, uh, whether it's a, a weather event or uh, an environmental event, a 
terrorist attack, transnational criminal organization is important. So we continue to watch that closely and ensure that our exercise programs, our security cooperation programs emphasize uh, the partner's capacity to do that because uh, as we see in some of these uh, massive hurricanes, no one nation has the ability to, to do it alone. Good. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Rapuano, um, uh, I want to first of all thank you on another topic for all the work uh, that you've done on the, uh, the Solarium Commission over the past year. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, very proud to be a part of that commission as well, chaired by Senator King and, uh, and Representative Gallagher and uh, very proud of the final product that's being released today. Uh, one of the major recommendations that we make uh, in the report is strengthening CISA at Homeland Security uh, to ensure that it has the authorities and resources that it needs to perform its civil defense mission. So Secretary Rapuano, do you agree with the Solarium Commission that we need to strengthen CISA? And uh, can you explain why the Department of Defense needs a strong partner at the Department of Homeland Security to protect uh, the nation in, uh, in cyberspace. And the last one, another key recommendation, is the importance of exercising uh, Sec Secretary, Rap uh, Secretary Rapuano uh, the, and General O'Shaughnessy, feel free to chime in, of course. Uh, can you detail how the department leads or, or uh, participates in national level exercises to better prepare us to act in situations where DOD assets are called on to support civil authorities? Uh, first, thank you very much for the question, Congressman Langevin. The Solarium Commission uh, was a very fruitful and productive exercise from our perspective in uh, the very frank, deliberate, in-depth discussions associated with uh, the evolving, growing cyber threat. And I think one of the most critical outcomes from it was just uh, strong coalescence a stronger, emphatic understanding of the whole of government, whole of nation context for which we must rely on to be able to respond to growing cyber threats. I think you just talked uh, about CISA in particular. CISA, I'm sorry. And, and comment on CISA. Specifically to CISA, uh, CISA is the lead for DHS, which is the lead federal agency for responding and providing support to industry critical infrastructure. Uh, CISA, of course, needs to be uh, resourced to perform that role. And we understand with the growing threat, there will be growing needs uh, in terms of the resources required to effectively perform that mission. And uh, we are very supportive of CISA being provided the appropriate resources to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all for being here for your service to our country. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, uh, in the President's budget, um, the Hawaii and Pacific radars were canceled. My first question is why. My second question is what kind of gaps does this create in coverage? And my third question is what are you going to do if the uh, SBX is not at sea when a threat arises? Sir, for, uh, just for, uh, for, for clarification, uh, we view that as being postponed versus uh, canceled. Uh, it is still a priority for us. Uh, there were some concerns relative to the executability of the funding, uh, as our SECDEF has comment, commented uh, about. I will say from my perspective, it is uh, with the SBX, we have the ability today to defend uh, all of our defendant area to include Hawaii. Um, what we would like to see, though, is this continue to be looked at to see how it fits into the overall system and our ability to execute that mission, to your point, uh, with the SBX being obviously an at-sea uh, platform and the risk uh, inherently involved in that. Uh, with respect to our vantage point, uh, clearly we see PACOM has put it in as one of their unfunded uh, priorities, uh, and, and we certainly applaud that. They also have regional considerations besides the broader GBI uh, execution uh, from the regional missile defense. For example? Uh, for example, as they look at the uh, capability they have with the other radars, the Tippy 2s uh, what they have at Guam, uh, threats that they have in the shorter range threat, not necessarily ICBMs, that this would contribute to as well beyond the NORTHCOM role in that specific uh, mission set. Okay. <clears throat> General, in your testimony, you say, quote, in order to reclaim our strategic advantage in the high north, it's critical that we improve our ability to detect and track surface vessels and the aircraft in our Arctic approaches and establish more reliable, square, com secure communications for our joint force warfighters operating in the higher latitudes, close, close quote. What specific capabilities would you like to see us develop to counter the increasing threats from uh, China and Russia? Uh, 
And is there something in particular they're working on together that concerns you? Uh, there is, sir. Uh, first, let me start with, uh, we have to start with domain awareness. We have to understand what's operating uh, in the approaches to our sovereign airspace uh, and territory, as well as uh, within the confines of our sovereign territory. Uh, we saw just yesterday, uh, you may have seen in the news, we had a Russian bomber uh, 60 miles off the coast of Alaska operating uh, in one of our ISEX uh, exercises we have where our submarines actually pop up out of the ice. The camp established for there, they were loitering about 2,500 feet above that. And uh, mind you, they were loitering with an F-22 and an F-18 on their wing uh, when they did that. So we have to maintain the ability to be able to react appropriately, not just for a strategic messaging type event here, but potentially in the future to actually defeat any threats. It starts with the main awareness, and then you need ability to command and control, and to command and control, you have to be able to communicate. We have severe limitations to communicate in the Arctic. Above about 65 degrees, it becomes limited. Above about 70, it becomes severely limited, except for our more exquisite uh, capabilities. I think one of the things we can leverage is the commercial technology that's out there. We see the proliferation of Leo, whether it be a, a company such as OneWeb, Starlink, we see amazing technology that's gonna bring literally broadband connectivity, the same you would have in your home right now. You could actually establish within the Arctic uh, very quickly in a matter of, of literally you know, a year or so. Uh, to me, that would actually fast forward our ability to operate within that, that uh, very difficult, challenging uh, battle space is having the ability to communicate. And so we have as our number one unfunded priority list uh, Arctic communications to leverage the commercial work uh, and the proliferation of LEO that I think would be a game changer not only for the military but also for the civilian communities. Great. Thank you very much. Admiral, in your testimony, you talk about South America's strategic location for space activity. Uh, can you give us, and how China's pursuing that, uh, can you give us some examples of, of what you mean by that? The um, one, one space station uh, China has uh, virtual control over uh, is what allowed China to land on the, on the dark side of the moon. Is that uh, the one that, in Argentina? Yes, sir. And uh, that's, that's an example. And so China uh, sees this, uh, as does Russia. And uh, they're working uh, the, to get their inroads into that area. Uh, fortunately, we're, we're pushing with uh, countries, good partners like Brazil, to increase our access and our cooperation in space. Uh, and I think there's some real opportunity there with some of the agreements we've signed with Brazil over the last uh, year, including this past Sunday, we signed a research development uh, agreement with Brazil that was uh, put together quite rapidly for types of uh, of agreements that will allow a broad range of technology and defense cooperation that, that could be included into space. Yeah, that's a very important point. I hope the committee takes note of that China and Russia are both making uh, great efforts to get toeholds in South and Central America, and we can't just ignore that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, General, Admiral, Secretary. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the Arctic. I happened to be up at ISAX this weekend, and we all waved to the Russians as they flew over. Uh, I just thought they were there to see me, but apparently not. Uh, we often talk about the threat from Russia. Can you also talk about the recent activities from China and what they're doing and how we or why we should be concerned? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you again for uh, allowing me to highlight one of my most pressing concerns is, is, is really the Arctic and our ability to operate there and what we see our adversaries doing. Specifically to the China question, we see activity, uh, for example, the Shui Long, uh, which is one of their scientific uh, vessels, that is probably the preliminary uh, work they're doing to bring up military capability and capacity to operate in the Arctic. We see that China declare themselves as a near-Arctic state. We see the economic investment that they are doing, and we've seen in other areas of the world where that coercive economics has a very Nef uh, nefarious intent behind it. But where specifically, if you could just point out the other nations they're investing in? Uh, well, obviously Russia. Uh, we see amazing um, activity on the Russian side, both in the, their installations that they are rapidly improving, as well as just their ability to operate uh, in that environment with a very robust presence and exercises and training. And I think from our vantage point, we also need to, to ensure we have the ability to operate in that, what is Frankly, it's battle space. We need to be able to operate in that environment. 
I would use the, the analogy that we can deploy a force anywhere in the world. We've, we've been very good at that in the United States of America, projecting power. You cannot deploy to the Arctic if you have not trained there, if you don't have the right quit, kit, you don't have the right equipment, uh, because it is such a harsh environment. And so we've been working closely with the services to increase the activity we see, the things like the training ranges at the, the, the ranges in Alaska, like the J Park range, continuing to invest in those so we have a playing field to go practice and scrimmage. Uh, we, we do see that as a, a principal avenue of approach that we need to be able to defend. So the Bering Strait is one of the primary areas up there. Uh, we see that Russia is adding some more uh, missile uh, assets to their side. What concern and how are we countering those? Uh, and as you mentioned, the, the deployment of the missiles to that very critical navigation uh, point that, that is a choke point for, for entry into the Arctic waters is absolutely critical. Uh, we uh, need to have the ability to uh, maintain our presence there, even in a contested environment. Uh, those missiles can strike Alaska and our, and our critical infrastructure within Alaska with very little indications and warning. Therefore, we have to have that persistent defense, that the persistent domain awareness, the persistent command and control, and persistent ability to defend, not be able to just deploy it up there in a time of need because we will not necessarily be able to get inside the actions of our adversaries. So we need, we need to invest uh, more in the Arctic. Just to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the defense of the homeland with our lighter defense. You had talked earlier about what we've done to increase the uh, capabilities. Hypersonics. How are we defending against the hypersonics, particularly if it was a submarine launch? So a couple of points I'd, I'd, I'd make on hypersonics. Uh, first, um, we uh, find that the, the hypersonics, for example, what's actually Russia has claimed and we've, uh, we see in place already with the Vanguard missile, the hypersonic glide vehicle uh, that has nuclear capability. Our biggest point on the nuclear capability is that we need to be able to give advanced warning. Uh, because it flies in a much different trajectory, uh, it does not unlike a ballistic missile where you can, under, you, can, you can get a radar on it and you know exactly where it's going. The hypersonic glide vehicle is unlike that. It has the energy to go to multiple areas within the United States, as an example. And so maintaining custody of that requires a different set of sensors to be able to do that. So we have to invest in our domain awareness, those sensors that can do the hypersonics. Uh, that's for the glide vehicle. For cruise missiles that we see, it, it shrinks the time. It shrinks the time you have to react. And so uh, there is an investment that we need to continue to make to stay ahead of this threat that gives us that we can operate at the speed of relevance relative to the threat that we see of these advancing cruise missiles. In 26 uh, seconds, talk about the time difference in, in what you can in this environment. How much has that cut down on the president's ability to make a decision? Uh, it, it cuts down a lot of both of the, it's the speed of it and it's the energy that it has. It can go to multiple places and that doesn't give you the ability to project that in, time, in a timely manner for our senior leadership uh, with our current capability. We need to invest. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I didn't realize you guys were cousins. Uh, your grandparents must have been so proud of you all. Um, that's just, that's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, General Song, you see, I wanted to uh, start off talking about the F-15C fleet. Uh, last year's posture hearing, you testified on the importance of modernizing the fleet for the homeland defense and the deteriorating status of the F-15C fleet and the urgency to replace these aircraft was the primary driver for the establishment of the F-15EX program. But this year's budget request reduced the number of F-15EX aircraft the Air Force planned to acquire from 18 to 12. So from a homeland defense perspective, is it still urgent to replace the F-15C fleet? And what are the vulnerabilities that we face if we don't quickly provide these units with capable and safe aircraft? Uh, Ma'am, thank you for letting me highlight that. First, uh, as you mentioned, the F-15C has been an incredibly important asset for us within the NORAD construct. The F-15EX, not only does it modernize it, and, and obviously an aging aircraft has maintenance reliability problems, but it just brings capability that are really applicable to us in the homeland defense business. Specifically, it can carry significantly more missiles, and so that one aircraft can actually have much more of effect relative to, for example, cruise missiles that you're trying to defend against. Second, has increased radar capability, so with the, that capability allows you to see further out and be able to react 
to those lower radar cross-section threats. And the third, I'll use the example of what you just saw a couple days ago with the Russians flying over uh, Alaska is the long lengths that we have to fly, 750 miles from Elmendorf, as an example, to before we were able to intercept that bomber. The f x brings you that extended range, which allows us to get to the archer, not just the arrows. In other words, we can get to the, the bombers before they actually launch those cruise missiles. So it really gives us flexibility, it gives us an in, in, incredible increase in capability. So I would, I would just continue to advocate for uh, the, the advancement of that F-15C and transitioning over to the F-15X uh, when, as fast as possible. Yeah. So what vulnerabilities do you have with seeing the reduction and the number of uh, EXs that we're going to purchase? Well, it's just a question of what gets, uh, obviously there'll be a delay in purchasing re re results in a delay in fielding. And so now we will maintain the current fleet of F-15Cs for longer as we, as we continue to Is advocate. Is that possible? For I mean, they're in really bad shape, aren't they? I mean, could you give us an update on, on the status of the uh, th They are, but we have just an amazing group of maintainers uh, that work incredibly hard. I mean, these, these aircraft, much like the F-16s, uh, are, are just older aircraft, but our maintainers are phenomenal, keep them in, the, in, in, uh, uh, in operational status. But we are putting a stress on the system. System, uh, and so I would just continue to advocate for soonest uh, replacement as soon as possible. Thank you. Admiral Fowler, Southcom's unfunded priorities list requests funding for ISR capabilities for drug interdiction and counter drug activities. So what are your current ISR capabilities, requirements, and shortfalls? And how will your mission be impacted if you're not provided with uh, adequate ISR capabilities? Well, the, uh, the impact of the transnational criminal organizations and the drugs and illicit things that they bring here to the United States, is uh, it's a national security priority and it's a travesty and, and, and we clearly need to do more. The, one of our, our gaps is in intelligence and ISR gives us some of our best intelligence in our maritime patrol aircraft, uh, unmanned aircraft. Uh, and, uh, and some shorter range aircraft. So we have gaps in all that. The, the Congress has been very good with an ISR transfer fund that has helped us fill those gaps. Uh, but, but still, we're trying to cover down on an area the, the size of the United States with a handful of assets. We also have gaps in, in ships, which are, we call those force packages, a helicopter, a ship, and its ability to, to search an area as well. And that's another significant gap. And I'd also illuminate uh, the impact security cooperation funds have in this uh, regime is for a modest investment, for example, in El Salvador Special Forces, we're able to extend the uh, security envelope hundreds of miles out into the ocean. Sure. It's a, it's a huge task. Um, how concerned are you with the military's dependence on China to receive our uh, pharmaceutical products from them? Um, as you know, America does not make aspirin anymore. America does not uh, make penicillin. 90% um, of the drugs that we uh, take here in our country, pharmaceutical products, come from China. 80, and 80% of those uh, components are, are China-based. And um, we see now they make all the syringes. They make our protective air mask, uh, face mask. And all of these things, the vaccines, antibiotics, and pharmaceuticals that our military have, come from China. With China being an existential threat, how concerned are you that they are our main source of, of medicine? And I apologize, but that's going to ha have to be taken for the record at this point, because uh, the gentlelady is out of time. Uh, Mr. Carbajal is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all you three for being here. Uh, the political crisis in Venezuela has devastated the Venezuelan people and has led to an increase in illicit activities such as drug trafficking, in addition, Venezuelan refugees have fled the country and sought temporary residence in neighboring countries, especially Colombia. Secretary Rapano, what is your assessment on how the Venezuelan crisis has impacted Colombia, Colombia's security and stability, and how has the crisis affected regional stability in general? Well, I certainly can say generally that there has been a significant impact uh, in, the re in the region on a number of countries. Uh, so I, I think that this is an ongoing challenge. It's a reason why it remains a priority for the president and the administration. Uh, and we are continuing to uh, increase the pressure uh, so we can look for the appropriate changes uh, in terms of the behaviors of the Venezuelan government. Thank you. Admiral uh, Fowler, an important aspect to strengthening regional security in SOUTHCOM is capacity building. 
through sustained engagement. Can you provide the committee an update on ongoing capacity building efforts and also state what the biggest operational barriers are for expanding these partnerships? The security cooperation programs that we invest in are long-term high payoff investments for the security right here at home and our, and our partners. So we're helping them build stronger institutions uh, so they can buffer their democracies from the shocks of uh, transnational criminal organizations and, and frankly, uh, to gain their positional advantage from the predatory practices of wannabe great powers like China and Russia. So it has a high impact and, um, and it's, not a, it's not a large dollar amount. So we'll invest in programs, for example, uh, to help a country set up an intelligence service from education to doctrine to a system so they can secure their own information and then that allows them to share it with us. Uh, this is our area that we focus on and prioritize on. What are the barriers to being more effective and doing more of that? So uh, one of the barriers is the stable funding. So what we found is when we don't have a budget that passes on time, we try to do uh, a year's worth of security cooperation activities in nine months or eight months. And then at the end of the year, we, uh, we often get scrutinized uh, for our lack of uh, good solid execution as we rush to, to get the money obligated. Uh, so multi-year money would be one. Uh, consistent funding levels would be another. Uh, and authorities uh, associated with those consistent funding, funding levels. Thank you. Uh, General Shaughnessy, I know this was, was, has been touched on a bit, but I wanted to be a little bit more poignant and specific with you. Uh, this week, the committee has discussed quite extensively uh, great powers uh, competition across the area's responsibility. With that, China and Russia continue to invest heavily in the Arctic as the Arctic increasingly is viewed as an arena for geopolitical competition. In DOD's report to Congress on its defense Arctic strategy, it states, Russia and China are challenging the rules-based order in the Arctic. Can you elaborate on that? Does the U.S. have sufficient strategy to counter Russian and Chinese efforts in the Arctic with the underscoring of sufficient? I think a, as a, 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 a part of that answer is going to be highlighting the great work in, done to uh, craft and, and, and deploy the 2019 Arctic, DOD Arctic strategy. Uh, significant change from the 2013 uh, version thereof, with the real focus on uh, and secure, of, of a secure and stable region in which the U.S. national security interests are safeguarded. The U.S. homeland is defended, so it recognizes that we must uh, be in the Arctic to defend our homeland, and that nations work cooperatively to address the shared challenges. And so to your point in there, while we do see some cooperation, we are seeing more and more of this uh, great power competition that has arrived in the Arctic. Uh, I'll use an example of what the Russians are doing with respect to the Northern Sea Route, uh, where they are claiming that you need to use a Russian um, icebreaker, you need to use uh, a Russian uh, pilot uh, on your vessel. That is not in accordance with the rules-based international order. And so I think we need to be able to um, uh, have a presence, have the ability to operate there if we are going to be able to show by example uh, exactly our ability to operate in these common navigable waters. Do you feel we have sufficiency? Uh, so what I would say is we need to invest in the Arctic. We, we are, I have seen an increase in that activity, uh, and we need to invest uh, in order to operate there significantly. So we're not where we want to be as of right now. The trajectory is in the right direction. More to be done. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I back. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us. General Shaughnessy, I want to start with you. Uh, recently, I have experienced and seen increased Russian activity off the East Coast. And that is of, of deep concern. I understand the Navy has stood up the Second Fleet as a counter to that increased Russian aggression. But I'm concerned that we're not adequately resourced to really address this the way we need to. You see the acquisition of sonobuoys being on the unfunded requirements list for the Navy. Uh, you see P-8 Poseidon production, our anti-submarine warfare aircraft, uh, that production being truncated. You also see now a, a delay in the, in the MQ-4 Triton program. Uh, that, all of those things cause concern to me. The, Na the Navy only has five long-range Surtas vessels, which are critical in, in being able to deter and detect activity in the, in the North Atlantic. We also see, too, that 
were on the opposite track on our submarine fleet, our attack submarines, where we are going to go from, from a high of 52 today to a low of 41 by 2028 in the Virginia-class submarine fleet. All of those things appear to me to be going in the opposite direction as we see increased Russian activity and aggression uh, on the East Coast. Uh, give me your perspective on the full scope of that Russian aggression, and are we properly resourced and positioned to be able to, to counter what we see, at least in the past two years, is pretty significant and continued presence of the Russian fleet in the, in the East Coast off the United States? Uh, thank you, sir, sir for uh, highlighting this. This is something that I, I think over time uh, we have well been able to uh, have the luxury of not having threats to the homeland that are literally right off of our doorstep. Uh, that environment is rapidly changing and has changed. Uh, we are uh, correspondingly investing in our ability to do that, but as of as of yet, we have to we have not yet achieved the capability and capacity that we need to maintain that competitive advantage. To your specific points, and you highlighted exactly the list that I would go down uh, ultimately. But I think the, the the ability to have that domain awareness. When I say domain awareness, it's not just radars that can see the air domain. It's from the undersea, the surface vessels, and all the way up. And so that investment, not only in the SIRTAS capability, but also in the IUSS, the the, the the ability to have the sensors under the water that can that, that can detect those in a persistent manner are critically important. Uh, I think continued investment, the Sony Blue, as you mentioned, we employed a lot of them this uh, last little bit to, to, without getting into operational details. But And I actually got to go down and talk to the crews uh, specifically that were doing some of those mission sets. And the good news is they did not feel that they needed to be limited in their ability to operate uh, as a result of the current status. But we have to be mindful of that going in the future, invest in that capability, uh, that attributable capability that we need to uh, have at, uh, at our disposal at any time. Uh, the broader point I would make to what you're broadly saying is these threats that, that, that used to be global in other areas, they are now here on our doorsteps and we must be prepared to defend against them. Do you think that the current budget request is a reasonable response to this increased Russian aggression? Sure, we've worked really hard with the United States Navy on this, uh, and I, I would uh, highlight the fact that they have put significant investment into the homeland defense architecture and the ability to be able to defend ourselves here at home. We need to we need to continue that resourcing, though. Uh, we can't it can't be a one year, two years, and be done. This is a continued investment that we need to make. Things uh, besides the resources that you think about in a budget, but as you mentioned, second fleet. That even just having our ships operate out there. Uh, in that environment that used to be just training, now is actually operational uh, level uh, commitment. In addition to that, we also see, I think, continued threats to our transoceanic cables. Uh, those are continual uh, efforts that I think our adversaries look to exploit. And as we went through last year's Back and forth in the Congress, we did put together a cable ship security program that says that we should have some, some ships available if, per chance, there is an activity against those transoceanic cables. Uh, my, my question would be, uh, what else should we be doing going forward? Is, is that threat a constant threat? Is it an increasing threat? What are the necessary resources to make sure that we are addressing that threat? I would, I would quickly just say that, yes, that is a consistent threat, and that's the way we have to look at it. We can't look at it as something we would just apply during crisis. This is something with so much of our communications going through those undersea cables. We must do it in a persistent way. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here uh, today. Uh, Following on uh, some of the conversations that, that we've had, I want to talk about um, Admiral Fowler, uh, the National Guard and the role that they play, especially in your AOR. Um, I know that they, they played a critical role over this uh, long period of, of the past 20 years of conflict or so, but um, I, I know that one of our Guard uh, units in Oklahoma is uh, particularly active along the Panama Canal, and, um, and I'd like for you to speak about the role that the National Guard plays and units like the 137th play in your area of responsibility around the Panama Canal for a moment, please. The um, state partnership program with our National Guard is, is, is one of our main efforts uh, to build partner capacity and readiness for our Guard units. Uh, it has the advantage of having the habitual relationship uh, over time, over many years, uh, that builds trust. 
and our investments in that program are, are good investments for the security here at home and our partners. The Oklahoma Guard currently is deployed to Columbia with two MC-12s. Uh, these are uh, deployed with, uh, in partnership with Special Operations Command. We're supporting our Colombian partners who are in a tough fight uh, with um, ISR, and that ISR has directly from those two units, and I went down and visited them, and they were, there's, it's, a, it's a real economy effort. To, there's about 40 of the Guardsmen there. Uh, they're motivated, and uh, that has directly resulted in uh, the Colombians being able to action ELN, FARC distance terrorists, and to get after narco traffic significantly making a, a huge impact, those MC-12s and Oklahoma Guard. Speaking of ISR and following up on uh, some of Ms. Hartzler's, uh, uh, Congresswoman Hartzler's questions earlier, uh, with the proposed change in the MC-12 and the needs for ISR in drug interdiction and, uh, and, and the work in, in uh, South America, uh, in this transition, do you see uh, the ability to continue the ISR that you need? Those uh, having the ability to assist our partners uh, develop their own ISR cap uh, capabilities, it means we've got to be engaged, present, provide our leadership. And these types of deployments are extremely helpful uh, to do that. And I would recommend that continuing these, these high payoff, low cost um, efforts, such as the MC-12s that are with the Guard unit. Um, as I understand it, those are slated to be uh, taken out of service with upcoming budgets. Uh, I think they're making the case right now uh, as to why it makes a difference, uh, both for the drugs that are taken off the streets in Oklahoma and the rest of our states, and to take that money out of the hand of narco-terrorists in our partners. Countries. So you see that as a valuable mission? It's an extremely valuable asset to have the ISR uh, in, in theater uh, with our partners. Thank you. Um, and. Admiral Fowler, uh, one more uh, area that I want to discuss with you, and, and that following on about the, the funding for narco-terrorism and, and uh, the impact. Uh, the 333 Funding Authority is designed, of course, to support programs that provide training and equipment to foreign countries to build capacity of partner nations. I know we've touched on this in several ways, um, but what challenges do you see with uh, the 333 funding process? Well, it, it, there's clearly there's never enough money to do all the things the department wants to do, and we've got to make tough choices. The Secretary of Defense has been clear about that, and uh, we're all in uh, to work uh, National Defense Strategy line of effort three, which it means we've got to account for every dollar of, of money we spend an hour of our time. So uh, as, as we look forward, uh, this uh, security cooperation funds have got to be applied in a manner uh, that directly impacts the future challenges. And so having a balance of these funds to look at the global fight is really important. The overall funds is about 1.1 billion, so it's a significant amount of money. Uh, applying that globally is, is really important as we leverage for the future. Is this pay, is long-term payoffs, and getting that right uh, is, is so important to us, and our partners depend on it. It's paying dividends here at home. Thank you very much, Admiral Fowler. I am uh, almost out of time, so I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Fowler, I think you've been very kind with your comments. I think the fact of the matter is DOD gives you what's left over of ISR after they fulfill uh, the other requests um, throughout the various uh, operating regions. And I want to just ask all of you this very quickly, just yes or no, should defending the homeland include defending American citizens from narco-terrorists and transnational criminal organizations? Yes or no? no. What's that? It's not a trick, it's, it's question. Not a trick question. I'll assume, you, all right, yes. I, absolutely, it's, it's, Congressman. Okay. It's, a, it's a threat to our homeland and the national security absolutely. strategy recognize it as such. Absolutely. So, um, Southcom's total operating budget for fiscal year 20 is $1.2 billion. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Right. So to put that in perspective, we spent 14 times that in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm sure it's a higher number. I don't know. We, we spent 14 percent. times that in Afghanistan. We have had 32 deaths in the United States from the coronavirus this year. Not to diminish that, but this Congress, virtually all of us, walked out on the floor the other day and appropriated over $8 billion dollars for the coronavirus, which has um, killed 32 people so far in the United States. Again, not diminishing that, but we lost 150 Americans yesterday to drug overdoses. We'll lose over 5,000 a month to drug overdoses. 
that are the end result of, of Congress and, and quite honestly, um, administrations not prioritizing defending the homeland from narco-terrorists and transnational criminal organizations. Uh, again, I mean, um, so your total operating budget is $1.2 billion. $75 million of your budget is for uh, theater security cooperation. Uh, General, that's the cost of, that's less than one F-35. That's one F, less than one, the cost of one F-35. In your written testimony, and this is what concerns me the most, you stated that you were unable to act on 91%, 91% of the shipments, despite having actionable intelligence and authority, that a shipment of narcotics was coming into the United States. How much additional money would be needed to lower this figure to 10%? Yeah, we're taking, we've taken a hard look at that. And as I've said in my open statement, as a result of illuminating those gaps, we have received support uh, from the Department of Defense and, and clearly uh, from the, the President's direction to increase our presence. Uh, to, to address the range of threats. Uh, it's an area the size of the United States, so the number of assets required to do that is, is significant. We're talking in the, in the dozens of uh, ships and force packages, which is why it's so important, sir, to get the partners in the game. Uh, getting the partners enabled, they're at 50% of the interdictions right now uh, with, uh, with the con our continued leadership, and sometimes that's, it's just time um, and some resources. And our whole of nation effort here, working with state INL and our DEA, we, we want to get those partners into 60% this year. So, so the, my concern with, as a whole, more Americans are dying from the, the actions of the transnational criminal organizations and violent extremist organizations in the Western Hemisphere than any other, than any other identifiable source. That number of uh, 90 percent, the, the 90 percent range, has not changed. As much money as we have given uh, to the DOD and in increased funding over the last um, 10 years, which has predominantly been the end result of this, of this committee, uh, we're still allowing 90 percent of the actionable items to come through. And so all of the additional money we've given has been transferred to other priorities and not to the priority that is, end of, that is, that is re resulting in more deaths than any other area. And I'm, I'm almost out of time, and, but I, I do hope the other members will go to Southcom and, uh, and, and look at the small things that could be done for a very small price that would actually take significant amounts of drugs off the streets of America. And as the chairman said, if it hasn't impacted you yet, and he was speaking of the coronavirus, it will, and I agree with him on that. But I'll promise you this, if you haven't been to a funeral of somebody who died in your neighborhood from a drug overdose, you're the lucky one. And I bet you that you will get to go over the next couple of years. Thank you for your work. And certainly I think the, the gentleman is correct, correct on the statistics. I, I would point out we need to work on the supply, but at the end of the day, it, it's a demand problem. Um, what, what drives the money, what drives, is, and you know, in Southcom and Northcom, what they do to get drugs into this country boggles the mind. I mean, they, they make submarines. They, I, I believe, a, a fake shark was, was once used to do this. They, we just heard about the tunnels that are going under the wall that would make Hamas proud in terms of what, what they've built there. Um, and they put ladders over the top. They, and why? Because of the money. There's a lot of money to be made by selling drugs to Americans who demand them. So we need to really, if that demand went away, there wouldn't be a problem. And I really feel in this country we do not focus enough on why is the demand there and what can we do to reduce it. If the market dried up, your guys' job would be a lot, lot easier. So we, we need to work on both. Uh, with that, I'll yield to Mr. Gold. Thank you, General O'Shaughnessy. I wanted to ask uh, kind of a follow-up to a lot of questions you got uh, from people earlier about uh, the, uh, your operations in the Arctic uh, with Russia and China building their, their presence out there. Um, 
recently uh, I was reading uh, a, a little bit uh, of a conference uh, where uh, Jim Webster from NAVSI and uh, the American Society of Naval Engineers was talking about uh, some of the struggles uh, with hulls and the ability to break through ice and, and navigate up there. Uh, obviously, we need more uh, Coast Guard icebreakers and, and such, uh, but he did make note that the destroyer, the DDG-51's hull, performs uh, fairly well uh, relative to a lot of other platforms that you might have up in that uh, region. So just a more specific question about the DDG as you're considering deterrence uh, and, uh, you know, the role uh, and requirement for freedom uh, of the seas that you have up in uh, that region as a mission. Uh, are you thinking about uh, what kind of consideration are you giving uh, to leveraging the capabilities coming online in FY23 uh, with the Flight 3 DDG, uh, particularly where it's going to have the anti-air uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities added to it? Or is that something that you're looking to use up in that region? Well, first, let me uh, start with the polar security cutter. Obviously, not within the Department of Defense, uh, but our partners within the Coast Guard uh, need this capability. They need it soonest, um, and, and they need it robustly. Um, and so it, without that ice-breaking capability, uh, the other sur the surface vessels will not uh, be able to operate. Um, that, that said, our DDGs have proven to be uh, amazing uh, platforms all over the globe. They will continue to do so um, in those regions, especially as we see diminishing ice. But they are not icebreakers, um, and so therefore they, they need the appropriate operating environment. I applaud the Navy's efforts over the last several years of really increasing their uh, their ventures into uh, the high north, the Arctic, uh, to actually get the crews out there, and they haven't been for, for some period of time, to experience it, learn those lessons, and make sure we have the ability to operate in that environment. Uh, and so I applaud CNO and I applaud uh, all of the operators for, for going up there, where it be the Harry S. Truman and others that we've seen. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see as we look into the future, uh, they are continuing that level of effort, uh, and as are some of the other services to be able to operate in the Arctic. Because if you're not actually doing it, um, you will not be prepared uh, to operate in that environment. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, just uh, throwing out there, uh, one of the things that, that I was reading in this particular write-up uh, is lessons learned uh, was something about uh, just old-school tactics. I don't know that I quite understand this as a Marine that didn't spend much time on, on a Navy ship, but they were talking about bringing baseball caps to uh, combat ice uh, growing on ships, Admiral Fowler. I don't know, maybe that's something you've heard. <laughs> but I thought it was uh, an unusual lesson learned from training up there. So it's important to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Um, uh, Mr. Byrne, you're recognized. Thank you. Emma Fowler, good to see you. For some time, you and I have discussed, and we've discussed on this committee, the need to have a naval presence in your AOR. You finally got the USS Detroit. Tell us what impact has come from that. Well, just uh, associate myself with the remarks of uh, General Shaughnessy on, on the importance of ships, Coast Guard assets, U.S. Navy ships. Uh, at the end of the day, we've got to have platforms to do the work, and they they both enable us to do detection and monitoring, to find and, and, and then use law enforcement assets, Coast Guard law enforcement detachments to do the interdiction. It also allows us to train with our partners and to perform a, a variety of missions. In the case of Detroit, the first deployment of littoral combat ship to the region, it performed above all standards, uh, good operational readiness. Uh, we took that ship off the coast of Venezuela. We did a freedom of navigation operation. The ship performed superbly. Ship was involved in counter narcotics operations and it was welcome. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see uh, that ship back. And so uh, that presence sends a big statement about U.S. commitment, sends a big statement to our friends, reassures them, and then to our adversaries, uh, that those, and those are capable platforms. Would you like to have more? We have a demand signal that is unmet uh, through the Global Force uh, distribution. I think our Navy would like to have more, and we'd like to have some of that presence in SOUTHCOM. Uh, our fourth fleet, which is uh, the uh, counterpart to second fleet in uh, Norfolk, they focus on building partner capacity, working with our partners and exercises. We've got to have ships to do that, We've got to have assets to do that. And um, I think the littoral combat ship, um, you, you and I have been to sea on one. Yeah. They provide uh, the, uh, the, the right kind of platform for this region. Uh, to meet our partners' needs. And the ships, it's, uh, it had some hit, hit problems in the past. It's working those bugs out, and we've been happy with the deployment of the Detroit. Good. 
Last year, we authorized and appropriated money to convert an expedi expeditionary fast transport to a medical transport. Does this type of capability help with your missions at SOUTHCOM? It does. We, we have um, one deployed with us now. Uh, we've asked for more. We think we could use it as a platform for, for a range of missions, counter-narcotics mission, uh, to put Marines on. Um, the Commandant of the Marine Corps has been very clear. He wants to get the Marine Corps back to sea. This, this platform can hold um, in the neighborhood of hundreds of Marines, and it can be flexible to move around and allow those Marines to engage partner Marines. The United States Marine Corps, like our Navy, are the gold standard. Partners want to train with them and learn from them, and, uh, and then that plays back when our partners uh, need to fight alongside us, as some of them have had to do in past wars. And so we welcome that ship as a, a flexible a platform. Uh, it turns out they're in demand by all the combatant commanders, uh, and we are making a case for why a couple more working in tandem with perhaps littoral combat ship as a, a floating logistics base in addition to working with Marines. You know, the fast speed, shallow draft, there's, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in those platforms, and we've asked for those, as well as we've asked for the uh, acceleration of the expeditionary staging bases, which are built out in, uh, in San Diego as a way to, to move Marines around the theater, uh, uh, make a statement of U.S. presence and commitment, and importantly, get our partners engaged in, in the training. Important platforms. Let me shift gears for a minute. Um, what effect has the reduction in foreign assistance to the Northern Triangle had on your ability to work with partners and allies in the region? The, uh, the funding's been and restored, and it's critical in the mill-to-mill -mill, uh, range that, that IMET training, for example, is, is what we'd apply to a country like Honduras. I use those examples. So while that funding was suspended, and, and, uh, and I agree that the pressure actually worked that we placed, and those nations have stepped up to do more on the migration. So the pressure was good. The, the pause in funding, to me, in a way, demonstrated the commitment of our, our partners. The Hondurans transferred money around, and they value our education so much that they paid for it. But something clearly didn't get done uh, as a result of that. So uh, the consistent funding in those realms is important to build their capacity. Uh, again, has to be a return, return on investment shown. We, we can, we've seen that. So there was an impact, but I, I think we're through that now, and we're moving ahead. And those nations have stepped up to demonstrate why they – are responsibly using the funds that uh, our taxpayers are, are providing. It's got to have a sh show return on investment. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, Ms. Torres-Small, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here and for your service to our country. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, uh, in the context of a heightened period such as we are in today with the eve of the 2020 elections and the aftermath of the Soleimani strike, can you speak to how NORTHCOM liaises with DHS's cybersecurity and uh, infrastructure security agency, CISA, F the FBI, U.S. Cyber Command, and the National Security Agency to monitor for domestically targeted threats from overseas uh, adversaries such as China and Russia? Yeah, thank you, Ma'am, for uh, allowing me to, to highlight some of the great work that is being done. And there is collaboration here, and that's the exciting part. Uh, literally, from the day that CISA stood up, literally the very day they stood up, we had liaisons embedded within there, and they had liaisons embedded within our uh, command and control uh, organization at NORTHCOM. And so literally from as it was birthed, uh, we were able to be part and connected uh, with uh, CISA. Almost every event that we do, we, we end up there with CISA because you can't separate home and defense and home and security to, to that point. Um, and I, in fact, I meet more with the Secretary uh, of uh, uh, Homeland Security, I think, than, I, than even the Department of Defense because we have such a, a tight relationship uh, there. And what's NORTHCOM's specific role in that partnership? Right. One of the things that we found is it, it is it is a team effort, right? And you mentioned the right uh, players that are part of that. One of the things Northcom has found is we can apply the same model that we've been using for hurricanes and, and applying federal capability to some of the state and local issues. We found that we can actually apply that using that model and taking the expertise, for example, in Cyber Command and applying it through Northcom in a defense support to civil authorities model. So I'll use the elections as an example in the in the, both the 18 and now even in the Super Tuesday, we just had. 
uh, we actually brought all of the tags in to our headquarters, and we had Paul Nakasoni from Cyber Command there and Joe and Gail there. We provided them information at the highest classification level of what the threats were that were out there. Um, we then gave them some capability and capacity that they could bring back to their states because it's just not fair for a state, like a local state like um, Colorado is where I live, uh, to be competing with a Russia, as an example. And General, so that brings I promise that I'm, I'm not cutting you off because you're from Colorado, but I do want to switch to get to another point quickly. Um, Admiral Fowler, I'm going to switch to you just briefly. I really appreciated my colleague's discussion with you about the Northern Triangle, and I just want to follow up slightly. Uh, I noticed in, in your statement, and I appreciate your concern, um, about South America's increasing uh, absorption into China's Belt and Road Initiative. And these tactics of predatory economics provide the pathway for China to hold significant leverage over the region's affairs. Uh, I know that you talked about the funding being restored, but during the time that it was frozen, do you believe that it helped malign actors like Russia and China grow in the region? It, it certainly uh, provides an additional window for there to come in and, and work their tactics and techniques. and, and uh, you know, what we hear from partners is that they don't, they want to partner with the U.S. Uh, they want to align with us. And I don't act, actually get into the choosing thing, but we do talk about democracies and values and consistent long-term relationships and respect for human rights and rule of law and those sorts of things that align themselves. And we then expand it beyond the predatory loans to IT that not only has a front door but a back door right into Beijing to uh, illegal fishing and illegal mining mm. and uh, construction of questionable construction and all these sorts of things. And, and the, the clear choice is to partner with the U.S. But in order to do that, we've, we've got to be present. And I think we're, we're at the level, we're back to the level now with uh, the countries, uh, Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that allows us to, to continue to commit and, and have them pay back on our security. And just very briefly, could you mention any specific programs that the State Department and USAID have that work especially well to enhance regional security and protect our interests in the Northern Triangle? We mentioned it several times today, the IMET program, international uh, education is key. The foreign military finance FMF program is a State Department program gained at its multi-year gains at security cooperation. That's important. State Department has a GPOI global peace operations uh, uh, program. That, for example, allows the El Salvadorians to deploy to Mali. Okay, I've got one more question, so thank you, and, and we'll follow up on those. Um, I apologize. Um, General O'Shaughnessy, one more question for you. As migration flow at our southern border has decreased, have the number of active duty troops decreased commensurately? Uh, Ma'am, they've been consistent throughout this year, this uh, both uh, calendar and fiscal year, uh, to what the request for assistance had come from the Department of Homeland Security. So you have not decreased the troops, they have not returned to their missions? Mm -hmm. they, they have not, they've been steady state. Okay, thank you. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Ms. Torres Small. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Admiral Fowler, um, recently I've been hearing rumors that there's a potential for up to a 20% reduction in security cooperation funding within DOD. If true, I'm extremely concerned about the disproportionate impacts these cuts will have in your AOR and also in AFRICOM, some of those places where we do a lot more with less. I'm extremely concerned that I think a large part of that is planned to be taken out of the state partnership program which uh, gives tremendous benefits uh, all across the world and is a low cost, so we cut something that's really effective. Uh, can you talk about the strategic risk that a cut to security cooperation and specifically the state partnership program would have on SOUTHCOM? The uh, defense wide review did cut 20% from the uh, department's, uh, what we call our triple three security cooperation uh, program. Uh, and those cuts have been distributed across the combatant commands. The, the um, FY21 percentage of that cut for Southcom is, is rate at about 20%. Um, Southcom's been decreased in that fund 32% in the last three years, and, and we've had to make some hard choices on prioritization, and, and prioritization's important, so that, um, there's no argument there in terms of prioritization. But our guard teams uh, and, um, and your state's guard team uh, partnership with uh, Bolivia is uh, they're key and they fall in on, they're often, those guard teams, state partnership teams, are the force providers 
that go along with the uh, security cooperation fund. So with, with, with just the people without the funds, it really doesn't provide a whole package for some of the engagements. We're looking at how do we restart our relationship with Bolivia, for example, uh, and that will be challenging for us to find the funds to leverage that relationship. I, I would argue that that's great power of competition in a long-term investment as we provide a modest amount of investment in a country like Bolivia or Ecuador or Peru that gives us leverage and allows us to train, allows us to be interoperable with our partner, allows them to get after threats that affect us and, and them. Uh, so the drug uh, threat is, is a perfect example. It pays long-term dividends and gives the United States of America positional advantage against future great power moves uh, from China and Russia. Somebody's going to fill the void. One of our chiefs of defense said, uh, when you need a lifeline, a life ring, you're going to take it from anybody. I said, yeah, but careful what the rope around that lifeline does to you. And, and you're right. Uh, we also have a state partnership with Uzbekistan, which has uh, yielded tremendous benefits in CENTCOM's AOR based on a state partnership and a personal relationship that I have that was established long ago through my guard state partnership job. Uh, talking about Bolivia, um, I'm hopeful that we can re-engage, and I know that our Adjutant General is re-engaging, and I think there's some opportunities there to get in on the ground floor and establish relationships that help us carry that, uh, carry that forward. So uh, I hope that we will continue to strengthen the state partnerships uh, in Bolivia and other areas, and also the IMET. We've got to use that. Uh, and I know that you do, but places like Bolivia where we haven't in the past had people in IMET, the sooner we get engaged, the sooner we are influencing and making friends with the leaders of 20 or 30 years from now, which is very important. I was just recently in Iraq, and uh, the, uh, the, the Chad was actually a guy I served with in five over there, and we recognized each other, and that goes a long way. So if you would, just briefly, uh, what can we do to strengthen the state partnership program in the Western Hemisphere? But I think uh, the, the things General Shaughnessy mentioned where he brings the state partners together, uh, we do the same thing. We bring them together. We talk about what our shared objectives are. How do we reach those shared objectives with a partner? How do we make the best? And pay, for us, a state partnership is our principal force that we send uh, to the, these nations. And so how do we ensure that we're doing that most efficiently? Predictability is important because we've got to be able to tell our partner nations and our state partners a year out that, that you can depend on this month, this time, that we want to be unpredictable to our enemies, but predictable to our partners in the Guard and to our, uh, our nation, partner nation. So stable on-time budgets, uh, the consistent funding level uh, are very, very important as we go forward. And, and just finally, I just want to compliment both of you guys and all our other COCOM commanders. You guys are really engaged with the state partnership program and give good guidance so that we make sure that our guard units from 54 different states and territories are engaged with the right priority, which are DOD's priorities. So I just thank you uh, for what y'all do every day with our state partnership programs. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Escobar, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you for being here today, and thank you most especially for your service. General O'Shaughnessy, it was wonderful to visit with you yesterday, and I really appreciated our conversation and the time that you took um, and your commitment to ongoing uh, communication, uh, especially with regard to Fort Bliss and El Paso. And my, my questions really are going to center around some of the conversations that we had yesterday. I know NORTHCOM oversees critical missions that help provide for our security, and you and I talked about how important those missions are. That's why one of the things I'm always concerned about is the opportunity cost of tapping military resources. When we apply military resources to legal asylum seekers, we take our eyes off of genuine national security threats. With regard to the latest crisis response force being deployed to the border, including to my community, El Paso, can you indicate what missions they would otherwise be engaged in, and how are those losses made up? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, I, I would highlight that uh, this force that we're talking about, approximately 160 uh, of which 80 went to uh, California and 80 went 
um, to, uh, to Texas. Um, that force is actually assigned to us uh, for this uh, particular mission set. Um, this is actually an opportunity to highlight the great work we do with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, realizing that, to your point, that this force is really for a different purpose. Um, and they allowed us to keep that force at home at Fort Polk uh, in order to maximize the readiness for that force. They were able to train together. They were able to stay at home with their families until they were actually needed for, in this case, what they were seeing as an increased demand signal as a result of the Ninth Circuit uh, court decision. Um, and so it, in some ways that was a positive because they have, since October, they've been on this mission set, but they haven't had to deploy to actually go do the mission on the border. Our commitment to DHS was that if they asked for it, though, we would make it available to them. So we did in the timelines that they uh, they were so inclined to do so. But this is a military police force. Uh, this 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 is uh, also includes helicopters and a general purpose uh, force. So uh, we have tried to walk that balance of maintaining the readiness while still contributing to our lead federal agency for securing the border, Department of Homeland Security. I do want to point out that what has been unusual and new and particularly alarming to my community is the sight of military uh, personnel with guns at our ports of entry. Ports of entry that are um, utilized every single day by tens of thousands of people in a community that is binational, bicultural, truly international, a community really that sees itself as one region. And um, we see our ports of entry as um, symbols of unity and symbols of friendship and familial ties as well, and economic ties. And the the um, while this this may be you know part of the umbrella of work, having seen this just happen recently has been jarring to to many members of my community. How long do you expect the crisis response force to be engaged at our ports of entry in this way? Uh, Ma'am, I would say first, uh, I want to send uh, kudos to our teammates in this. Our Department of Homeland Security brethren, our, our Custom Border Protection, they do a phenomenal uh, uh, effort every day uh, across not only the ports but across the border uh, at, at large. Um, specifically to this particular deployment, um, it, it, will, it will last as long as uh, Customs and, and Border Protection feel that they need to have this capability there. Uh, I, so I can't give a specific answer. It's not tasks. It, it's actually on... Uh, call, if you will, for the remaining of the fiscal year. I don't believe it'll be deployed for that long. Uh, I suspect uh, over time, in coordination with Department of Homeland Security, they will relieve us of that particular mission set. I would also note that they're, they're not the primary responders. They, they're there as a backup for our, for our lead federal agency in, in doing this mission. I understand that. Um, it still is really jarring to have families who have been used to seeing our ports of entry um, in a very positive light suddenly see uh, military enforcement on, on, on these ports. Are they, uh, what are the specific duties? Are you, do you know what the specific duties are for the folks that are actually on the ports of entry? And I'm running out of time, so if you wouldn't mind just being a uh, succinct. Very quickly, and this uh, may, might actually help. Uh, the, first, we transport the, the DHS members, the CBP members to the right place. Second, uh, we provide uh, the engineering capability to move obstacles if they need to move obstacles very quickly. And only third, in a tertiary role, do we have our military police that could be uh, employed. Thank you so much, General. I, I just want to reiterate for the public that um, the Congress has funded the Department of Homeland Security, um, two supplementals, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and I believe they are well equipped to, to do the job. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all of you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Escobar. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Rapuano, um, I want to thank you for your consistent engagement with the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Thank you for mentioning the work of the report uh, in your testimony uh, and the concept of layered cyber deterrence. We are, as you mentioned, uh, releasing our findings today. Uh, for those who are interested or perhaps having trouble sleeping, uh, this is the final report. You can get a copy from all of us for the literal tens of people watching on C-SPAN right now. This is the report right here. Uh, but we do hope that we can spark a debate and your work was uh, essential to the final product. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to, because so much of our final strategic recommendation involves building upon the progress that's been made within DOD around Defend Forward, 
Could you briefly sort of describe the genesis of Defend Forward and the steps you've taken to implement that as part of DOD's overall cyber and national defense strategy? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Congressman Gallagher. Defend Forward is, is really about preempting, deterring, defeating malevolent cyber activity targeting the United States. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to be forward. You have to be understanding how adversaries are operating, what tools they're using, what, what uh, techniques they're applying. So that is, that is really the driving uh, emphasis of our strategy in terms of where we were several years ago and where we are today. And then a lot of what we talked about in the course of the Commission's work was, you know, in some sense, the difference between deterrence and cyber and strategic nuclear deterrence in the Cold War is that there was little margin for error and for failure in the latter, but we start from a position of sort of constant failure, particularly below the threshold for military force and cyber, and therefore we need to build in a certain level of resilience in the face of failure. Do you think with that in mind, and when we talk about homeland defense, let's say there's a significant cyber attack, uh, would it make sense to have some sort of continuity of the economy plan in place with accompanying legal authorities to be more resilient and be able to recover uh, quickly in the, uh, in the case of such a massive cyber attack? So I, th I think what you're getting at is identifying the most critical infrastructure functions that may be vulnerable to cyber, identifying them as such, and applying specific measures of effectiveness and, and the applications of security that should be applied to those systems, and thinking through what rapid reconstitution would, would be required uh, if there were successful attacks against these most critical elements uh, of the nation's economy and other vital functions. Thinking through the unthinkable and being ready prior to a crisis to potentially mitigate the effects of a Correct. crisis. Correct. Um, and then finally, I just would say one of the, the recommendations that may not get as much attention is this idea that we've talked about at the subcommittee level of having the Cyber Mission Force do a force structure assessment. Those of us who deal with the Navy argue about you know, the Navy's force structure assessment or lack thereof sometimes. Similarly, the Cyber Mission Force was designed based on outdated requirements from 2013. And so we are sort of asking you and General Noxoni and others to do some analysis and tell us, given everything that's changed in the interim and the threat landscape in cyber, what is the appropriate force structure for cyber? Is that something that makes sense to you? So Secretary Esper has already tasked that to be done, uh, an assessment for cyber operating forces, uh, you know, looking back at what drove the original numbers, where we are today, the very significant dramatic changes in terms of the threat environment as well as in the capabilities and authorities of, of the Department of Defense and, and other agencies uh, as well. And what, what is that, uh, how well do we understand what types of capabilities, expertise uh, need to be represented in that for, force? So that's being done as, as we speak. Well, fantastic. And again, thank you for your engagement with the Commission. Thank you for your leadership. And again, and a shameless plug to the Commission's work. Uh, it's also available, shocker, online, uh, solarium.gov, for those who would like to read the final work of the Commission. We hope this will, if nothing else, spark a debate about the status quo in cyber. And uh, I think all of your testimonies have shown how important this new domain of geopolitical competition that is cyber is. So thank you, gentlemen, for all of your service. Appreciate thank it. And you. I yield back. Mr. Gallagher, would you like to submit those for the record? That is a great idea. Can I submit these for I, the record? I ask unanimous consent to include uh, into the record all member statements and extraneous material, including the Cyberspace Solarium Commission reports. Without objection, so ordered. Ms. Lurie, you're, you're recognized. Thank you. And um, I'd like to follow up on my colleague, Mr. Burns, uh, comments about the LCS deployment. Uh, to Southcom, and over the course of these hearings last year, I specifically asked each geographic combatant commander uh, about the presence that they have received in their region versus what they have requested through the GFM process. And um, it's good to hear that we've increased exponentially from zero to one um, this year, but I wanted to focus back on uh, the importance of that deployment to the Southcom region, and you mentioned FON Ops, so Freedom of Navigation Ops, partnership missions, um, counter-narcotics operations. 
And just for a moment, I'd like to focus on the capability of the LCS as a platform, um, as a suitable platform for those types of missions in the Southcom AOR. Um, and as a caveat, the reason I mentioned that is because in other hearings with the Navy, um, there's been discussion of decommissioning the first four ships of the class um, as early as 12 years in their in their life. So, can you comment on how effective that platform is for missions in areas such as Southcom? It's a very effective platform. It's versatile has a large flight deck. Uh, the uh, variants uh, that we've deployed, uh, we've sent with unmanned uh, fire scout capability as well as manned helicopter. That really exponentially in improves the uh, ability to uh, search out the ISR um, over time. The uh, mission capability, the large internal uh, reconfigurable spaces are important for the full range of mission sets. We've, uh, we've been up to Mayport, Florida and visited some. I've taken my Marine Forces South uh, commander with me. Lots of potential there for Marines uh, to, to go afloat with a flexible uh, maneuverable ability so we can partner as a naval force uh, with our, our partners uh, and in exercises as well as the mission sets uh, that you, uh, you mentioned. So would you include in the utility of that platform also the, four ships, the first four ships of the class? Um, we are looking at decommissioning ships well beyond the end of their service life, yet it sounds like the, the baseline capabilities of these ships would be useful within Southcom for the missions that you're accomplishing. And, and broadly, um, ma'am, I'd, I'd say numbers do matter. There's a, there's a value to capacity and the capability it brings. I, the, I know the Navy's challenged with the budget numbers and readiness, and I know there's been some challenges with these lead ships of the class on readiness. I don't, I don't think I'm in a position uh, from the readiness trade-off and cost to comment on the utility of those first four, but I would say that broadly we don't have enough platforms. Right, so I was going to say presence is important, and presence in the Southcom AOR, you've reiterated numerous times how important that is um, to our allies and to the other actors within the region. And so um, I've frequently discussed uh, the OFRP or the Optimized Fleet Response Plan um, and how that is not generating as much presence as I believe the Navy's capability has. So if I'm taking it, you would prefer to see more presence generated um, than purely surge capability from the vessels that the Navy currently has, not even talking about upcoming shipbuilding. Well, you stated it uh, well and, and better than I. Zero is, is equal zero in any math equation or it's infinity unsolvable. So we have to be present in some levels to compete. And so that persistent presence is important in addition to the presence that we might provide from an exercise. And so it does take numbers of ships to do that. I think that uh, the OFRP readiness model is capable of generating the right readiness for that presence. Uh, not all the ships have to be, in my view, to go to South America, um, in Latin America, the Caribbean, ready for every warfare mission. They have to be safe to steam. They have to be able to protect themselves. And they also have to be able to partner and do the counter-narcotics mission set. And so I think we can look at this um, globally and, and put the right presence at the right time, and ships are one of our critical gaps. And you also mentioned earlier the MMSV, the multi-mission support vessel. And can you talk a little bit more about that construct and what other types of somewhat out of the box uh, type combinations of vessels, whether they be contract, MSC operated, um, Navy or Coast Guard that could provide further capabilities that are really specific to your region and that essentially done at, at a lower cost um, than our high end ships such as DDGs or cruisers? Well, thanks to uh, filling unfunded uh, priority, this innovative multi-mission uh, vessel uh, is, um, is making a, a huge difference. Uh, and uh, we're, we've put it in as an unfunded for next year at $18 million for the, uh, the request. And I think it's a game changer. So you're basically saying $18 million is making a big difference. That's $18 million funding for the entire year for the ship, for the multi-mission vessel. I would also just uh, be remiss if I didn't talk about how much more the Coast Guard's doing. They sign up for four uh, force packages a year, and they're currently supplying eight. And so the Coast Guard is, is punching well above its weight uh, in this uh, AOR. It's great to see the Coast Guard uh, providing that um, capacity. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd like to think uh, further about the MSC platforms um, and specifically how we could leverage those types of platforms for exactly the mission that you're talking about. So I'd like to have an opportunity to continue that conversation later. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luria. Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for everything that you do, and, and Admiral, thank you for, for your time uh, this week. So I just wanna again shift back to some of the great power competition that we're seeing in our own backyard. Uh, I'm not very sanguine about it at all. 
I think we need, as this committee and as leaders, need to be ringing the alarm bells uh, to the American people who I don't know fully appreciate the level of what's going on uh, just to our south and, frankly, across, across the United States. So while I fully support the, the national uh, defense strategy, I'm not so sure about the apportionment that we're seeing in this budget, as you heard a number of members mention. I mean, this committee will literally authorize hundreds of billions of dollars of, buy, of buying more stuff, a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of it focused on the Taiwan scenario, and I fully support that. Uh, but as we've all mentioned, security assistance is great power competition. Uh, partnering with our partners is great power competition. The, uh, the state partnership program, Florida's partner is Venezuela, is great power uh, competition. So while we're kind of you know, shoulder to shoulder or, or force to force uh, wargaming out the Indo-Pacific, we have the termites eating up our foundation right in our backyard. And I find that incredibly, incredibly concerning. Uh, so. First question for you, Admiral. Can you tell us more uh, about China and Russia, boots on the ground in Venezuela? It's mentioned in your testimony, advisors. Are those uniformed Russian military that are on the ground in Venezuela advising the Maduro regime? We have Cubans in the thousands, Russians in the hundreds, uh, Chinese in lesser amounts. Uh, these China, uh, Russians range from contractors working on air defense systems working on uh, helicopters, working on SU-30s, to uh, special force, uh, the highest end special forces that are present. Uh, Spetsnaz. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh, more broadly, I'd like to expand the Russian presence in the AOR. We saw a record number of Russian uh, ship deployments this year. Uh, the the uh, cable survey, cable cutting ships uh, currently on station doing their work here. Uh, Russian uh, high-end frigate that has uh, cruise missile, nuclear capable cruise missile that came around and, and with several other ships came into NORTHCOM's AOR. Uh, late last year, we had Russian bombers fly into Venezuela. So Russians uh, have also invested in a training center in Nicaragua. Would you say that the Monroe Doctrine is at, at risk? Well, I think the Russians uh, see the value of their access, presence, and influence uh, here in the hemisphere, as well as the Chinese. You mentioned the, the Chinese. Uh, yeah, we've been asking ourselves the question, Ambassador Maines fought the hard fight as ambassador in El Salvador. You know, why would the Russians, or the Chinese, excuse me, try to lock up 75% um, of the coast of El Salvador in a 99-year lease? Now, they were thwarted, but they're still at it. Why is China trying to buy a deep water port in Jamaica and why has China built a road across Jamaica, which they have a 50-year lease to collect all the tolls on that road? It's not a very good deal. I think in addition, I was just down in Panama uh, with uh, Representative Rogers and, uh, and Representative Scalise. I think the American people need to understand the Chinese own the Panama Canal now. They own the ports on both sides, uh, and they're putting the ports they don't own out of business. And we have had frigates that cannot stop and get the repairs they need because the Chinese ownership, backed ownership, have said no. Do you find that concerning? And, and you know, obviously a part of our con plans, our contingency plans, be able to shift our fleets from east to west or vice versa. And if the Chinese own the Panama Canal, built by Americans, does that concern you as a military commander? Our most significant exercise every year is the defense of the Panama Canal exercise. And as you noted, uh, uh, pre Should we be back in Panama? Sorry, Admiral, I'm just very short. Sure. Should we be back in Panama? I think American so. boots on the ground? I think it's uh, something we should approach carefully with the government of Panama. The new government is very aligned with U.S. interests and is looking to reverse some of the Chinese influence. And we should approach carefully uh, what the best access is there. Uh, it is a strategic location, and we need to stay engaged there. Je uh, General, just in my time remaining, my understanding uh, in, the, in the Bahamas, the Chinese are very aggressively moving into the Bahamas, 50 miles off the coast of the United States, uh, and buying shipping or fishing rights when we have one of our most sophisticated underwater uh, testing facilities there that test all of our, 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 our submarines, our unmanned vehicles. What are we doing in terms of the Chinese uh, influence in the Bahamas? 
And uh, as I'm short of time, I'll just uh, broadly say that uh, we are concerned about the Chinese influence here, both from the commercial investment uh, in resorts that then re uh, equates influence. Autec is the, the particular place you're referring to. We have sensitive uh, operations there that we want to keep uh, sensitive and, and be able to do what we, what we do there without intrusion from the Chinese. Uh, so yes, we are concerned, and I think sometimes we forget um, that uh, it's General, miles off our coast. Uh, can I take the rest expired. of that for the record? I request that you uh, take you. this conversation for the record and uh, Mr. Garamundi, you're recognized. I almost want to yield you another five minutes. You're onto something very important, Mr. Waltz. Um, every answer to your question was, we're concerned. That is totally unsatisfactory. Yeah, we're concerned too, but what are you doing about it? With the Chinese, our, our best efforts are to stay engaged through education, exercise security cooperation. One of our main well, maneuver We've already forces. heard that the security cooperation money is being taken out of the appropriations and out of the budget. We had that discussion earlier. Uh, the point here is, yeah, we're concerned. But at the same time, we're not providing the resources that that concern can actually result in action. And there's much, much more. Nobody here has yet asked about the infamous border wall ripoff. $11 billion. $1.1 billion, $1.4 billion or $2 billion taken from the National Guard across the United States, all of them, for their equipment. Mr. Rapuano, is that creating a national security problem within the borders of the United States when the National Guard doesn't have its equipment? The, the answer is yes. Okay. Is it yes or no? The decision was it was a prioritization process made to by the Secretary what? of Defense. To build a border wall. To meet, that, a, to meet direction from the President to address a homeland security okay. challenge that so the Department was not So the President's decision. What is your own. view? My, my, my view is that DHS is supporting the enforcement of laws on the border, legislated by Congress. Okay and is overwhelmed in terms of its capacity by the numbers crossing illegally. That is a lot of, that's just not factual. You know that's not factual, so don't, don't give us that, all right? That, that is that, factual. Then deliver to me the facts. Not alternate facts, deliver to us the facts, okay? When will you have that, those facts in my office? We can provide you all the information upon which we based our response to DHS. When will you have it in my assistance. office? We'll, we'll provide you copies. When? Of, when? Yeah, tomorrow. No, not tomorrow, but. Uh, but when? Next Don't week. dance with me. When? Next will you week, deliver I those think facts? We can do that. When? By Wednesday of next week. Very good. I'll expect it. You'll have it. Eleven billion dollars taken out of the Department of Defense activities all across this world, including within the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, New York, New Mexico, critical national projects that were determined by the Department of Defense in this committee and the Senate, military construction projects. So when are those going to be built? Presumably they were important. They will be funded in the years ahead. They were deemed to be not as critical in terms of funding now. Okay, I'd like to see the analysis of that criti criticality. Will, will, will you deliver that to my office next Wednesday also? Why the border wall of which uh, on the construction projects, 3.8 billion was taken out of those military construction projects across the world. Less than $900 million has been obligated, that money, $2.9 billion has been set, sitting unspent for the last year. Are you aware of that? It's a fact. That's $2.9 billion of critical military construction projects that have not been built, but that money is sitting unspent, unobligated, somewhere in the Department of Defense or the Treasury or OMB or somewhere. Can you explain why? 
It is more important that that money be unspent, sitting unspent, rather than those construction projects, including the European Defense Initiative programs, not going forward, that were deemed to be critical in pushing back against Russia's aggression. Can you explain that to me? I'll pass your request to the Comptroller. No, this is a policy question. Uh, and I'm, you're I'm the sorry, policy Congressman, I don't, I don't have the status of all those, the funding elements in terms of uh, your it understanding that they're frozen. It is a fact that $2.9 billion is sitting unspent and unobligated. Apparently, I'm out of time, but I'm not out of questions. You have been participating in a monumental. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Appreciate all three of you being here. It's great to see General Shaughnessy again, who I served with off and on in my Air Force uh, career. So great to see you here. My first question is uh, to Admiral uh, Fowler. I appreciate hearing your, your, uh, the information you've been sharing on Russia and China's investment. So I won't go down that path, but that was where I wanted to go as well. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit the status of Chile right now? I know a few months back there was a lot of violence and uh, demonstrations there, and, and they're a good ally, so I was concerned. Thank you. Well, they are a good ally, as you mentioned, uh, and they are an exporter of security. As we speak, a Chilean frigate is deploying with a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier strike group to the Asia Pacific, and this is a demonstration of the Chileans' commitment to uh, global security, not just hemisphere security, and it's a, a, a demonstration of the Chileans' high-end capability. Uh, there's a lot to learn from working with them. Last year, we partnered with Chile and hosted UNITAS Pacific in, in uh, Chile, the, the nation, in fact, the world's longest-serving maritime uh, exercise, and, and Chileans led that exercise, and they led it capably. Uh, we're working uh, to do additional partnerships with the Chileans in cyber and in the land domain. And so uh, we continue to have a strong relation Earl earlier this uh, year. Unfortunately, they lost a C-130. Uh, we've we searched some assets to try to help them do the search and rescue, but it was in the horrible uh, conditions of the, of the uh, Antarctic. Um, closely looking at the instability, uh, we're very pleased to work with our partners that have remained professional. As it's starting, to, it's their starting to calm down. Well, I, I think we haven't taken our eye on the, okay. on the off that ball, but uh, we're in constant dialogue and sharing intelligence with them and, and helping them. There was recently a report, too, of some violence in Colombia where the rebels used to operate. Are we still in a good uh, position there in Colombia? Um, or are they, are they doing all right with, their, with the peace agreement that they have? I, I would, um, sir, I'd fight along the Colombians any day of the week. They're fighters, they're professional. Uh, they have tough security challenges that they've overcome. Plan Columbia was a success. It was a long-term right. uh, investment. They invested $10 for every dollar that uh, other nations invested. They've got a lot of challenges. Uh, so they've got terrorists. <coughs> the recent reports, was that, were they just one off, or was that just, or is it hopefully not a reoccurrence? Well, we're, we're again, we're watching that okay. closely. They have close to 2 million migrants in their country. They're dealing with the uh, FARC dissidents. They're dealing with uh, narco-traffic, narco-terrorism, and, and a significant uh, challenge there. Um, the, they're, they're working all these challenges, and they're continuing to export security. Last year, they trained uh, 1,500 special force units in Central America uh, to help them get after their fight while still working their security challenges at home. So it's our, uh, a top priority for us right. working with Colombia. I flew with the uh, Colombian Air Force about a half dozen times. Extraordinarily professional. I was impressed. <laughs> General Shaughnessy, uh, you talked a little bit about our ability to detect ICBMs, and we have some capacity to interdict them. And you also mentioned it's much harder on the cruise mi with the cruise missiles and uh, the hypersonic weapons, and that we need new capabilities there. What, how does your budget request, how does it get towards this problem? What, what things are we trying to invest in to detect? Uh, th these new threats. Yeah, first, uh, if you indulge me for one second, I'll reminisce back to our time in service together. Thank you for your great work in the United States Air Force and then continuing to serve uh, in Congress and then on this committee to continue to influence uh, national security. 
specific to your question, this is a, this is a very difficult challenge we're faced with going forward. One of the ways that we're really trying to get after it is uh, working with industry, uh, instead of just going after a particular widget and saying, we need a widget to do this, to do this one mission set, we're actually going with industry and saying, here's our challenge. We need domain awareness. We need to understand what's happening from undersea to space. We need the ability to command and control that, and then we need those defeat mechanisms in a holistic system. And by really talking to industry and collaborating with industry, we see what's in the realm of the possible. And so we've actually had some success there, and then we're taking that into the budget process, because instead of asking like traditionally we do within the DoD is asking for a partic particular system, we're actually looking for a system of systems. And so how do we bring that into the acquisition process? Uh, we've had some success this year of really focusing on home end defense, and that's why this year, 2020, is a year of home end defense, because we now have that traction. Now it's time to turn that into actual results so we can defend our nation. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Crow. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you to all the witnesses and your continued service to the country and your testimony today. Uh, I understand that the FY20 counter drug funding has been put on hold uh, and may be cut up to $90 million to pay for U.S. Army core operating costs to execute border wall construction for FY19 projects. Uh, Admiral, are any of your counter drug or drug interdiction projects impacted by this hold? Uh, there was a delay in uh, flowing counter-narcotics funding. Uh, that that money is now flowing. Uh, so to date, we've had no uh, impact to what was programmed for the FY20 uh, level for our counter-narcotics funding. How long was that delay? It was, uh, it was uh, several months into the year before that money uh, started to flow. So the you uncertainty really impacted our ability to do the, the kind of long-term management that we needed to, but we worked through it and now the money's flowing. Do you anticipate any cuts for your FY20 plan projects? There has been discussions about uh, cuts. You mentioned uh, a figure. Um, to date, we haven't received any cuts and uh, our, our accounts are, uh, we've, we've got a good plan, uh, spend plan based on the, uh, the current amount uh, for the rest of the year. And if there are any reductions in FY21, how will that impact your region? This money is about one, about one third of all our funds for uh, Southcom or counter narcotics money. They're critical uh, for the security of the United States of America. They're saving lives. So uh, reductions in funds are going to be something that we're not going to do, uh, and that is going to result in uh, some uh, narco trafficker that's not taken off the battlefield. Uh, and, and for all the witnesses, uh, are any of you anticipating, have you, or have you been ordered to create plans or in the process of planning for uh, additional deployments to the southern border? Not, not beyond the current support that's, uh, that's being provided. So as of today, there, there is no planning uh, for additional troop level increases to the southern border? Not as of today, no. No plan, sir. Okay. Uh, shifting gears uh, just briefly uh, on the issue of Arctic uh, uh, control and the increased pressures in the Arctic, there are plans to increase the number of our icebreakers. Uh, you know, there have been appropriations for um, you know, both the planning and the start the construction for those icebreakers. So, uh, General O'Shaughnessy, starting with you, um, are the current plans sufficient? Uh, in your view, over the next five years, the field the icebreakers that are necessary to counter both Russian and Chinese uh, influence in the Arctic region? Well, first, I would applaud the effort of the U.S. Coast Guard and, and the U.S. Navy that has supported uh, that procurement of the icebreakers. Uh, I've, I've actually been on the Polar Star, our, our uh, icebreaker that it is, uh, you know, 44 or so years old. Uh, we, we need these icebreakers, and they need the polar security cutters now. I would also say that as the deployment happens, six, normally six of them, at least three heavy, uh, initial deployments likely to Antarctica. And so we, we have to look not just at the first one that will uh, be operational, but when is the second and third one going to be operational, which we'll need in the Arctic uh, as well. So, so from my perspective, I'm very pleased that we are making progress in this. Uh, we had uh, significant funds this year, over $500 million applied to it, but we need to continue that program, and if anything, we ought to be looking to accelerate it. So the, the six, as we understand it, uh, it, would that be sufficient in the long term? Because I know Russia has upwards of 20. Uh, clearly, it's a start. Um, I, I, my, uh, as we work closely with the Coast Guard, um, this, especially with the three heavy uh, as a minimum, uh, potentially up to six heavy, depending on how they end up doing the procurement, uh, will give us a start. But this, this is, uh, we see diminishing uh, sea ice, more navigation actually increases the need for those icebreakers uh, in order to uh, take advantage of the Arctic. Yeah. 
And Admiral, could you just very briefly classify for me, as we talk about the, the pivot to great power competition, a lot of people view that solely as an Indo-Pacific pivot, but could you just paint the picture for us as to the Chinese investments uh, in, in Central and South America and how you believe that fits in with their overall strategy? Yeah, it's, it's clearly a global uh, view uh, for that great power competition. It's playing right out here in our neighborhood, the significant increase in foreign direct investment in loans, uh, China's number one uh, uh, creditor, uh, the Chinese trade. I think by the end of this year, we'll see that China is the number one trading partner with the whole hemisphere. And as as I've emphasized, our presence with small units like Joint Task Force Bravo, which is 685 uh, soldier sailors, Marines, airmen, that's our main maneuver force along with our state partner. That's that's key to anchoring our positional advantage in this hemisphere. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, and I think that concludes our, our questions from members of the committee. Um, Mr. Thornberry and I would uh, both like to thank you very much for your participation today and for, for answering these valuable questions that will provide insights into the process as we move forward for the, the NDAA, and uh, thank you again. The hearing is adjourned.